Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're hailing from. Welcome to a very special OpenShift Commons uh, episode today. Sorry, Diane. <laughs> I am Chris Short, executive producer of OpenShift TV. I am here with the one and only Diane Mueller. Diane, what are we doing today? What's going on? Well, today, um, it's it's interesting. We're about halfway through the year 2021, and, and it has been a very interesting year, probably a very interesting year and a half. Um, yeah. And we've um, been hearing um, and having lots of um, OpenShift Commons gatherings. We've had three so far this year, one on data science, one at KubeCon, and one just recently um, at Summit Part 2. And we had some amazing end user talks. And um, halfway through the year, what we thought we would do is bring you some of the best of those um, to tempt you to watch the rest of them um, and tell you a little bit about um, the the role of end users in the commons and what the commons is. Um, and then sort of Netflix bingey style, um, watch some of these together. And um, I just think some of these were um, really amazing stories, journeys to an open shift, new workloads that I hadn't seen. You'll hear some really interesting talks. So um, I just wanted to, to really emphasize that um, these come from across multiple communities of people from different um, market sectors, whether they're telcos or banks, or one of them is uh, the, the first one you'll hear is from the Department of Agricultural, Agriculture and Fisheries and Marine Life in Ireland, um, the version one talk, but lots of different folks. And all of them are helping us um, make connections um, with each other, share stories that are helping um, Red Hat engineers and upstream project leads um, un better understand the, what they need to put into the products and the projects that they're creating. Um, and collaboration is happening all over the place. And I, that's really one of the things about this um, community is that they've been really amazing um, at connecting cross communities. And some of these stories really um, showcase that today. So we thought we'd, we'd grab a few of them, play them for you, play them with you, um, and take your questions in the chat wherever you are. Um, and basically, what we're trying to do is, as always, promote peer-to-peer -peer interactions. And so here are some of your peers um, sharing their end user stories, their production use cases and workloads, what they've integrated into their stacks, because um, it's not all about OpenShift. And you know we do this in commons briefings at gatherings. You do this in working groups and SIGs and in you know CNCF tags. Um, we're always talking on Slack. But here's an opportunity to kind of sit back, relax, um, enjoy the show, and um, hear some of these stories. Because really, what it all comes down to is uh, commons is really for end users and by end users. Um, Today, if you haven't heard me rant before, um, a lot of the model of open source is changing quite a bit. There are a huge number of um, open source projects that our end users, customers, have been pushing out and putting into uh, the CNCF and other open source foundations. Just the other day, we heard um, a, a briefing on cruise control, a project that LinkedIn has donated to the to CNC, uh, to, to has put out as open source in GitHub. Um, it, you know, there's just a ton of things that are happening besides the production use case. There's a lot of folks you'll hear um, in the one on Health OS from Anthem about. Spiffy and Spire and Envoy and all of the other projects that they're participating in. Uh, it's just been a very interesting first half of 2021, and um, we encourage you to join OpenShift uh, Commons, uh, share your stories, and get introduced to your peers. Um, so today we're going to kind of kick it off. Um, we have I've picked a few of them. Some of these are my favorites, um, and so you may have your other favorites. They're all mostly on YouTube. The last. Four are still um, in the Red Hat Summit session catalog um, and are available there um, on demand. And they will get un uploaded into YouTube eventually. Um, but um, we're, we're going to run through. And so this first one that we're going to talk about, I just want to set it up a little bit. Um, this is uh, version one, which is a Red Hat partner. Um, and Filippo Sassi is going to talk a lot about um, version one has a really unique way of um, working with their clients, sort of a little bit like the Open Innovation Labs at Red Hat, um, but they also have this wonderful government 
um, agency that they've been working with in Ireland and helping farmers and other folks get um, and process uh, grants and doing it all using some text analytics and AI um, and making sure that it's all GDPR compliant. So I'm gonna kick off with that. Um, ask any questions you want in the chat. I'll share all the links to things um, as we go along and at the end of this as well. And um, just really um, excited that you're here with me uh, today to watch this together. So grab some popcorn um, and uh, let's get started. Okay, so thanks anyone for making the time for joining this uh, presentation today. Uh, during this session, I'm going to introduce you one of the application we, we have implemented for one of our customers. Uh, the application makes use of text analytics and artificial intelligence to reduce the risk of GDPR uh, breaches. But before diving into that, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Filippo Sassi. I am a senior software engineer. I've been working in the industry, in the industry for quite a few years by now in companies like IBM, uh, Concentrix, and obviously Virtual One, which I joined in 2014. Uh, in my career, I covered a number of different roles, uh, .NET web developer, Scrum Master, Tech Lead, since 2019 when I joined the Virtual One Innovation Labs, where I am now one of the leaders. Virtual One is an IT consultancy firm driving uh, customer success uh, through over 20 years of market leadership and innovation in IT services. Uh, Virtual One believes in modernizing, innovating, and accelerating our customers' business transformation. Our greatest strength is in balance in our efforts to keep growing in all the three sides of our strategic triangle. Uh, the first side is customer success. Uh, so making a real difference through long-term outcome-focused uh, relationships. Uh, then empowered people, uh, selecting, empowering, and trusting people who are wired to deliver customer success. And the third side is strong organization, so a high-performing, financially strong organization of the highest uh, integrity. We believe that this is what makes uh, version one different, and more importantly, our customers agree. On this uh, slide, some uh, stats about version one. Uh, the interesting thing, I suppose, is the quick growing rate on some of the uh, figures. And I'm not going to lie to you, to create this deck, I reused some of the slides from a previous presentation uh, we ran in October 2020. Uh, this slide at the time show um, just over 1,300 employees. In just uh, uh, two quarters, uh, we're already reaching 1.5K. Um, uh, I think that more than any other number, this uh, demonstrates how virtual one is growing while uh, committing to our core uh, values. Uh, DAFAM is the Irish Government Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Uh, DAFAM vision is to be an innovative and sustainable agri-food uh, sector operating to the highest uh, standards. Um, DAFAM is one of the oldest uh, Version 1 customers and Version 1 provides many teams dealing with the uh, different DAFAM schemes, applications and more. One of these uh, teams is the BPS team. BPS stands for a Basic Payment uh, Scheme. Uh, BPS is the largest payment scheme run by the department, and specifically, the scheme is responsible for issuing grant uh, funding to the value of 1.2 billion of euros to 120,000 farmers in line with the European Union regulation. Uh, the team handles application and payments uh, of farmer grants through the BPS application, which is, um, can be accessed through modern digital channels, which uh, makes the customer journey easier with fewer administrative overhead. In the uh, last couple of years, DAFAM has invested uh, heavily in the OpenShift container uh, platform. Uh, this choice was primarily justified by one of the uh, key strategic aims for the department uh, to provide a capability for fast, flexible application deployment and at the same time to be responsive to uh, changing and emerging needs over time. Uh, all of this while focusing on small uh, products that can be designed uh, quickly, iterated, and released um, often. 
In particular, uh, the OpenShift container platform uh, was a suitable choice for the project I'm shortly uh, going to introduce you, uh, because there was real concern about using public cloud services uh, to scan and analyze documents which might contain uh, personally sensitive information. The, this solution reaffirmed the uh, department belief that the uh, investment in the OpenShift platform would provide long-term strategic uh, gains. In uh, line with the uh, public service ICT strategy, DAFAM is focused on digital transformation, including both front-end and uh, back-office transformation to deliver services for uh, citizens, uh, businesses, and the government. From May 2018, the General Data Protection um, GDPR regulation came into effect, uh, requiring businesses to uh, protect the personal data and privacy of the European citizens for any transaction that occurs within the uh, uh, European member states. Um, in line with these requirements, with this regulation, one of the often priority for uh, transformation was to protect the personal data for not only the different customers, but also for the customers of the public service as a whole. And in particular, we consider the following uh, use case. Um, to, receive, to receive grant payments, uh, the farmers must upload various uh, documentation through the department website. Uh, these documents often contain personally sensitive information, which might not be uh, indicated by the user. Uh, there is a checkbox, a checkbox on the form, and that indicates that the document contains um, PSIs. Uh, if ticked, uh, just that certain le levels of the staff can access the document. However, very often uh, the end users don't indicate the option uh, correctly, and this leads to a situation whereby department staff reads uh, documentation to which they should not have access. Um, another challenge, of course, when uh, agents acting on behalf of the users sometimes upload their own documentation, and this uh, leads to approximately 60 major GDPR breaches uh, every year. Uh, so, whatever the source of the breach, both scenarios could lead to privacy violation and GDPR uh, breaches due to the staff accessing the document without uh, a sufficient uh, clearance. These uh, breaches uh, require significant effort to address, and they are obviously taken very seriously by uh, DAFON. Uh, the department wanted to understand how technology could be applied to assist, and to answer this question, uh, DAFAM uh, version 1 on-site team contacted uh, the version 1 innovation uh, labs. The uh, labs um, is, are a very good service that version 1 provides to its customers uh, to explore disruptive uh, technologies. Uh, a couple of points to note here. So it's uh, version 1 customers. That means that whatever we do, we do it for the clients which are already within the um, version 1 customers uh, base. And for them, we are a value added service. So we are free of charge. That doesn't mean that we are free of cost. Uh, indeed, uh, we are expecting to use their data. Uh, we are expecting to use their resources. This will have particularly an impact on cost if we decided to go uh, cloud. We are expecting to interview their employees to better list their requirements. Uh, we are expecting them to test the POV. And uh, finally, we are expecting at least uh, one person from the uh, customer side to play the role of the product owner and to actively collaborate with us almost on a day-to-day -day basis to implement a proof of value. The proof of value is the same thing of a, of a proof of concept, basically a fully working prototype. We just apply the semantic suite to highlight that what we do actually bring values into the uh, customers' uh, businesses. Um, so far, we have implemented at least one POV in all the technological areas uh, shown on the slide, the only exception being the IoT. Some of those POVs were quite cool. I remember one of the first one I worked at when I joined the lab was a uh, um, proof of value for a virtual uh, reality application using Oculus Kit headset. For the same uh, customer, we immediately implemented another POV, this time uh, using uh, augmented reality on an Android tablet just to show them the different experiences. Uh, both the POVs were very well accepted, received by the customers but we understood that uh, to 
push this forward, to move this into production, and to um, provide the client with the wow factor they were looking for, we simply didn't have the right capabilities within the company. That's because uh, these technologies are quite neat, and to, um, they require very advanced uh, um, graphical skills, especially 3D graphical skills, which are almost those required in the gaming uh, industry. Um, so from 2020, we decided instead to focus on those uh, technological domains where A, we got plenty of expertise within the company, and B, where we think that our uh, customers would have uh, benefited the most. And those domains are machine learning, artificial intelligence, and robotic process automation. The uh, innovation engagement process with DAFAM was exactly the same standard approach that any version one customer faces when engaging with the labs. The uh, process is the following. It always starts from ideation. So we are constantly uh, talking with our uh, customers to understand if they are facing uh, business problems which are not solvable by standard day-to-day -day, uh, technology. When we identify one of those problems, we start researching. So we look for uh, academical or industrial resources. Uh, we run uh, brainstorming and design thinking sessions until we found a technology that could help solving the problem at hand. And when we identify such, such a technology, we start experimenting with it. When we're happy enough, when we think we have found a potential solution, we formalize it into an innovation canvas. Uh, the canvas acts like a contract between us and the, and, the, and the customer, and the document contains information such as the problem we are trying to solve, uh, the, the proposed solution, the people who will make the, uh, the development team, uh, a timeline and the metrics that will be used at the end of the project to uh, determine its uh, success. When all of this is agreed and the canvas is signed, we start with the actual implementation. Uh, we are following an agile, uh, iterative and incremental methodology called uh, Scrum. We take up to six bi-weekly sprints uh, to implement the POV. We won't do six um, for the sake of it. If at the end of uh, a sprint, during the sprint review, the customer agrees that we have uh, uh, solved the problem under investigation, we consider we have proven the value of the technology. We got in touch with the rest of the version one delivery teams uh, to define a roadmap for moving the POV uh, live. So this is exactly the same process as DAF and follow uh, when engaging with us on this particular uh, use case. And the outcome, the outcome of the whole um, process is smart text. So using best of breed open source technology, Smart text provide text analytic capabilities to extract meaningful insights from unstructured data. So documents, images, PDFs, etc. Uh, these insights are the features that are later used for artificial intelligence modeling to ultimately classify if the document contained or not personally sensitive information. Uh, obviously, this is just one of the many possible applications. Smart text could, could be used by many other scenarios, and we will shortly see some examples. But for now, let me just uh, dive a little bit more into the uh, components of the solution. The first one is the OCR. OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition, and this component uh, extracts the textual uh, content from the unstructured uh, documents. This uh, textual content is then utilized to derive useful metadata attributes from the uh, other smart text components, which are uh, sentiment analysis, uh, topic modeling, semantic word search, uh, regular expression extraction, and name entity uh, recognition. Each of these components is exposed as a separate API, ensuring loose uh, coupling and easy recombination. The APIs use cutting edge open source libraries with a with appropriate customization for these and other use cases. As example of customization, we are currently retraining the open source uh, machine learning model with specific set of documents for making the models uh, domain specific. The SmartX solution in DAFAM is deployed on-prem, but all the components are deployed as containers to ensure uh, portability of deployment across cloud uh, too. 
Um, from a deployment perspective, um, we, we said it already, DAFA made a um, significant investment in an on-prem OpenShift container platform. Uh, as a consequence, we wanted that smart techs utilize the power of the platform to demonstrate its value. And that came out to be a great choice, as the OpenShift platform helped us solve some of the issues that we could have faced uh, otherwise. Uh, for instance, the smart text uh, solution was designed to take advantage of the Python uh, machine learning uh, libraries, but this architecture was not supported in the DAFAM infrastructure. Uh, the OpenShift platform allowed for secure deployment and build of Red Hat published containers, but would have been in, uh, would, would have been impossible otherwise, given the available budget and time. Uh, likewise, uh, building our test uh, and production environments for the project would have normally been another large cost, but this was easy, easily overcome with OpenShift and image uh, streams. The uh, solution is currently uh, live, acti actively mitigating GDPR risk for farmers and agents, flagging potential errors during the uh, documents upload. This has enabled the department to switch from a, a reactive to a proactive approach of identifying uh, data breaches and isolating them and preventing them from occurring. Uh, this obviously reduces the administrative overhead and the lost business hours of the employees having to resolve any potential breach. And obviously, this also reduces reputational damage to uh, DAFA. The project uh, demonstrated that the department led the way in using cutting edge open source technologies such as OpenShift and natural language processing uh, libraries. For, for what concerned in the labs, we were able to demonstrate our credibility in the areas of text analytics, uh, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Uh, the SmartTech solution is now a key piece of our Smart Action Suite that we are developing. Uh, we will shortly talk about the Smart Action Suite. Here, I just would like to say that uh, since we have implemented the solution, we are having many conversations with our customers and smart tech stories generated really interested. Um, we immediately understood that creating an ability to extract valuable insights and metadata from a structured document, being them forms, handwritten letters, images of documents, whatever, would be hugely valuable behind the initial use case. Uh, for instance, for uh, one of our customers in the UK, we have been recently implementing a document summarization tool, and the, the, the goal of the tool is to provide um, key pieces of information from uh, the end to the end users from a set of documents without the user having to read any of those documents. At the core of this solution, there is smart text. Uh, we have also recently demonstrated it to many other clients, uh, both in Ireland and in the, in the UK. All in all, we think that this project is an excellent demonstration of how open source technology could be uh, utilized and augmented to develop solutions which, which are comparable to the major cloud vendors. Uh, indeed, we, we uh, commissioned a report to compare smart tech solutions with similar technologies from Azure and AWS. And this report showed that the performance from those smart techs are very much comparable to those of Microsoft Computer Vision and Cognitive Services on one side and AWS TechStrat and Comprehend um, on the other. Uh, within DAFAN, the smart tech solution was the first application deployed on the OpenShift uh, container platform, and as such, it ironed out all the usual technical challenges uh, we deploying onto a new platform. I was not directly involved in the um, original de um, development, so I won't spend too much time here on the technical challenges and the subsequent uh, learnings. Uh, however, talking with one of the main developers, I found particularly interesting that one of the weakest points of the original implementation was the central role of of the orchestrator components uh, in, in the original architecture. Uh, because of the orchestrator, that architecture was uh, highly coupled, uh, working through a set of well-defined steps to be executed together. Uh, being so, the orchestrator needed to know everything about anything else, making it the single point of failure. That is, the orchestrator goes down, everything everything else goes down too. Uh, so we look, at, we look at more modern uh, architectural approaches. So at the end, we went for a reactive-based architecture, which make the single components responsive to relevant changes in the data. Uh, the benefit of this architecture are many, mostly responsiveness, uh, resilience, uh, elasticity. 
Uh, I previously mentioned the Smart Action Suite. So before concluding this presentation, just uh, please allow me to uh, quickly introduce it to you. Um, before we look at the standard innovation journey our customers are facing when engaging with the innovation uh, labs, the journey goes from ideation to the successful implementation of, the, of APOV. However, over time, we noticed that many of our customers were facing similar problems. So instead of reinventing the wheel all the time, uh, we have decided to start productizing over existing POVs and build what we call the Smart Action uh, Suite. This is a suite of components which could be used either, either in isolation or like Lego bricks could be combined together in different numbers and order to build many solutions which could apply to different use cases and scenarios. Scenarios. Some of the components, like Smart Text and Smart Data Capture, have already been develop developed. The other will be implemented in the next uh, future. The overall idea here is to provide our clients with a hyper automation set of apps which empower their employees, allowing them to take a better and more efficient decision in a shorter time. In a nutshell, the key components are shown on the uh, slide. We already talked about Smart Text. I will just introduce another couple of them. One is Smart FAQ, which is our uh, smart bot providing organization with an always-on 24-7 service answering FAQs to customer queries. Smart Data Capture, an app to support enterprise data capture requirements. Uh, smart Search, a solution providing uh, intelligent document search where a user can search for queries in conversational language and the right answer the right reference uh, from the documents will be returned. Uh, smart automation, uh, best of breed automation tools to develop hyper automation, so with a combination of RPA and AI. And finally, Smart Process Advisor, which is designed, in, designed to guide staff through uh, organizational processes, advising them each step of the way. And that was all I wanted to share with you today. I hope you find it interesting. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, you can answer it in the chat below. Well, hello, everybody, and, and, and welcome back. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk um, we just did with uh, Filippo Sassi. And um, now up next, we have one of my favorite people, Joseph Myers from Rodian Schwartz, who has been a longtime member of the um, OKD, the Open Source Side of OpenShift uh, Working Group. And he gave a great talk um, at uh, KubeCon um, EU uh, uh, talking about some of the benefits of working with um, the open source side of things, um, as well as talking through his journey um, and Rodian and Schwartz's journey to running um, on Azure, on uh, the Azure platform um, and OpenShift. So without um, too much further ado, but a suggestion that if you're interested in um, working with OKD um, and working and joining the OKD working group, you can go to okd.io um, and join uh, there and you'll find all the links to join the Google group and we meet every Tuesday um, at 1600 UTC and um, we'd be thrilled to have you join. Um, but here, um, let Joseph tell you a little bit about um, his road to, um, it may have been bumpy, but it was lots of fun to do it with together and collaborate with the Rody and Schwartz team. So um, kick it off there, Chris. Hello, my name is Joseph Meyer. I'm an electronics engineer and cloud architect at um, the company Rodi and Schwartz. It's a, a German uh, Munich located uh, company. I'm an OKD user since uh, 2018 together with my team. And this is a story how we came from OKD to OpenShift in three years. We had uh, started a digital, digital transformation program in spring uh, 2018. And the goal was to get the skills in my company to build up digital business. And one of the first goals was to create uh, an MVP of a cloud product for a trade show that um, happened uh, in autumn 2018. That's only five months after the start of the program. And this was very tough for us because we had experience with Docker, but not with Kubernetes. And it was clear to us that we want to do that with, uh, on Kubernetes. And the first task for this MVP was to provide Kubernetes clusters, um, two ones, one 
on-premises for our developers um, because we have the policy in my company that no source code ever has to be available in the public cloud. So we um, created or had to create a cluster on-premises for our developers so they can access the source code and do builds for their um, artifacts. And the second cluster should be in the public cloud so our customers uh, can access them because we don't serve um, our software from our on-premises cluster to the internet. We have separate clusters for that. That was the goal and the first task and the race started. We had a few requirements for that. Um, at least there were three very important ones. The first one was um, don't pay any license fees for the Kubernetes distribution because, uh, yeah, we started with our digital business and we didn't want to ha have a burden of the license fees on them. And the motto was let the business grow first. So this is uh, the most important requirement in the beginning for us. The second one was um, the system must be stable. That's obvious, yeah, but we learned that it's not so easy to achieve. Um, we must take, and the distribution should take care about everything uh, that yeah, you don't want to mess around normally with, with networking, with storage, and a, a few more things. Yeah, we learned a lot about that. It's a hard way that it's not easy to maintain these things if you have to. So uh, yeah, and also if you look back, it's it's one of the biggest and most important requirements you should uh, take into account if you choose a Kubernetes distribution also. The third requirement was that we um, would like to have the same stack um, on premises and in the public cloud and the same user experience. So um, that our developers don't have to switch around in their minds um, with, with the usage of the tooling. Um, independence of if they use the on-premise cluster or the public um, cloud cluster. We wanted to have a look and feel that's the same everywhere. Then we went into an evaluation phase. Five months is uh, very tough, so we rushed uh, through that very fast. First, we tried the obvious. Uh, we used uh, vanilla Kubernetes to create our first clusters and had take care about everything on our own storage, networking, usability was, was uh, disastrous in the beginning. And so we gave up very soon. That was not the way we wanted to work um, together with our company. So we were searching for something better. So we tried out several community driven Kubernetes distributions. I don't want to name them, um, but we had mixed experiences. We had problems with stability. Uh, I, I remember one tool that had an automatic install of a clusters and every second installation failed uh, because of bugs. User experience was not so good on the others. So we were, yeah, we had no good feeling that we are on, on the right track. That was a, was a very tough time for us. During this evaluation phase, um, it was it was a pure coincidence that we attended a sales presentation for OpenShift because OpenShift um, violated our most important requirement that we don't want it to spend money for our Kubernetes cluster. You remember we did not want to have the burden of license fees on our digital business. Um, but um, yeah, it, it sounded very good what we heard here. The salesman uh, did a very good job in this presentation. And um, yeah, he told us about that there is a free edition or a community driven edition of OpenShift called OKD. And this is something we never heard about during our research. Um, and yeah, it was, it was awesome because on the paper, it was free. It was a turnkey solution, uh, very similar or, or 
at least almost the same as OpenShift um, regarding the features. It uh, took care about storage network, had a nice UI at that time, um, and, and great dev tools, took care about builds. Everything was integrated very good in the web UI. It was great for our developers. We also got very, very good feedback from them. And the third one was that okay, D3, we could we could install it everywhere, um, on premise, on our vSphere um, clusters, and in the public cloud in Azure. It was very easy to get clusters running. We had lots of configuration options. We had um, Ansible um, out of the box coming with OKD that uh, did the installation. And it was great. We tried it out. We used it for our MVP in the end, and yeah, we successfully delivered our MVP on the Trejo running on OKD. Um, and yeah, management was very happy uh, with us, and it was a was a cool time. It was very stressful, but uh, we learned lots of new things during this phase. A year later, in 2019, we delivered even more cloud products. Yeah, and we were the heroes uh, because we enabled all of them with, uh, uh, yeah, with a great distribution. Uh, in 2019, everything was everything was cool. With with OKD, we were very happy. We didn't uh, regret that we chose it. Also, in 2019, we improved and automated our cloud ecosystem. Because uh, for the MVP, we have uh, taken lots of uh, shortcuts and workarounds because we were not so experienced with Kubernetes. Uh, and the next goal was to automate everything. So we found lots of tools that helped us a lot in this phase. Ansible, we had experience with that before. I found Terraform. Uh, that's absolutely great tool for creating um, infrastructure on yeah uh, different look yeah di with different providers um, it's available for vSphere Azure AWS for for everything you can imagine so we use Terraform to create the uh, infrastructure and Ansible to um, install and configure OKD then we created CI/CD pipelines. I liked a lot that um, OpenShift had great support for Jenkins, uh, or has great support for Jenkins. Everything is tightly integrated in the web UI. That's nice. And also, we created um, our first service, uh, self-service portal. That's a tool running on our cluster that um, provides our developers uh, simple wizards in a web user interface um, where you fill out a few fields and get tasks done on the cluster, like uh, setting up a CI/CD environment with Jenkins with the proper secrets, everything um, completely automatically set up. Um, people liked that, and um, yes, it was was very cool. We learned a lot in this at this time. Um, in the beginning months, we learned that. Um, the last release of OKD3 um, occurred on in autumn uh, 2018, and no new version came came out. At that time, um, OpenShift 4, in the beginning of 2019, I think, OpenShift 4 was released, but no OKD4 was available. And all over the, the completely year, no OKD4 was uh, in sight. And this was a problem for us because more and more tools did not work on OKD3 because um, Kubernetes version, I think it was 1.11, um, got uh, too old for lots of tools and we had to wisely choose which tools we use. This uh, was manageable, but yeah, we were waiting for something new for OKD4 and uh, it did not come. So we started to yeah, learn what's blocking the release of OKD4. I, myself, was, uh, I tried um, OKD4 Alpha in November 2019. I remember that because I had a colleague of mine. Um, so he was a master of our DNS server and he spent um, Saturday evening 
was Saturday night together with me in a Skype session to set up everything we need for OKD4. He helped me debugging the first steps. And in the end, it worked. I saw a web UI. I was so happy. The, I remember that this web UI was so much advanced over that we um, already laughed with OKD3. It was so, so much better. And, but it was not um, easy to get there. Yeah. I had to do lots of manual steps, uh, hacking around in the OS, in the Linux uh, console to find problems, why, why the installation failed. And it, it was an alpha. It was okay. And yes, and it worked on vSphere very, very good. If it, if it ran, it ran very pretty good. And I, I, um, dove, um, deeper into development. I found this, uh, open shift dev channel on Slack. And I also found out that there is an OKD working group. At first, I thought this is a closed club of Red Hat employees, but learned very fast that everyone who uh, wants to help can attend this working group. So I did. Um, and the goal was to, to help or do my best what I can do, um, to bring, uh, OKD for, um, life. And yeah, that what I did in 2020. I started helping with OKD4. So, um, I created a few fixes for the installer for Azure, for example, because Azure, um, at this time did not, was not supported by OKD at all. Um, because there were a few problems with Fedora chorus that is used on in OKD in comparison to Red Hat chorus that is used in OpenShift. There were a few problems with that. Not, no big ones, but this was my first attempt to create a pull request, um, to the OKD4 community, GitHub repos. And my first PR was so big, uh, because I also patched a uh, Terraform code and it was far too, far too big. And Vadim Rutkowski, one of the main supporters of uh, OKD was, uh, refusing it. Um, he, he used some nice words. I don't remember, don't remember. I was, uh, I was sad that it was uh, refused, but yeah, he told me it was too big. I understand that I created a much uh, smaller PR and this one was accepted then and Azure was available for OKD. This is one of my first steps. I did lots of testing at that, at that time. I built up a home lab, home lab uh, at home uh, with the Horizon PC and uh, 16 cores. I never used them. Um, to that level, but I want, wanted to be sure that I am not blocked by anything. I did lot, lots of testing. I also organized, um, vSphere license. There is a, some, uh, try, no, it's not a trial. It's, um, it's called VMware user group. I don't remember exactly the, the product name. It, it's available for 150. Uh, euros, it's very affordable. And I did also that because I wanted to get OKD4 live. And I reported lots of bugs, fixed several of them. Uh, not all bugs are so complicated to solve. Uh, I found out. And yes, yeah, so this was my, was a time where also our team learned much about the insights of OKD4 and that we can use the me mechanics, um, to almost solve any, any task we wanted to achieve. Um, yeah, it was, it's, it's a great, great thing. I also did, um, something, um, that may sound a, bit, a little bit crazy, but, um, I created a t-shirt for the working group video meetings. I always uh, attended them regularly. And, uh, the idea was to increase the release pressure. Um, if everyone always sees this OKD 4 GA, uh, on my shirt, it, it was not so, um, it was more a funny idea. And I promised to not uh, change the shirt before the release, um, has, uh, been made, but it took a, a few months. Yeah. I have to admit that I changed the shirt in between. I never told that to anybody. Finally, OKD4 was released in July 
2020 was very great because we had uh, already prepared OKD4 um, clusters uh, on-premises. We installed everything and only were waiting for the for the GA uh, signal. Um, a few months before, I discovered Argus CD. That's a tool um, for GitOps, and I found out that with OKD4, it's very easy to configure things uh, with GitOps because there are uh, operators everywhere. And you can use um, also custom resources. That's a configuration method of operators with GitOps. This is also great. Um, so you have everything in Git, no no scripts running uh, once, and developers are changing configuration, and nobody knows uh, um, afterwards who has changed what, because everything is in a cluster. Git is a single source of truth. That's nice with Argo, and uh, especially in combination with OKD4. We changed our self-service portal uh, to use GitOps because of that. Um, and also we migrated all on-premises apps from OKD3 to OKD4. We had to change the routes and other few things. Of course, the DNS um, name for OKD4 contains, I think, uh, a part that is called apps in the, in the uh, URL. Uh, that's a little bit annoying, but yeah, we had to change that for all our apps, uh, and in the end it worked. Since uh, July 2020, we upgraded um, OKD4 on-premises very often. It almost always worked great. Um, between OpenShift 4.6 and 4.7, there were a few hiccups, um, but we could always fix it or find workarounds together with the community around them. Um, yes, since 2018, um, we attracted many of our, of our developers to start a Kubernetes journey um, on uh, create a digital business on our Kubernetes platform. That's great. Um, I counted uh, last week that we had onboarded more than 50 projects, not only playgrounds, uh, but real projects on our OKD clusters. And it's available for more than 2,000 developers in my company. It's running running very stable. And uh, but we are using we are moving more and more business critical applications to our OKD clusters. We have a big manufacturing, uh, a, a few manufacturing sites to be more precise, that want also to use um, Kubernetes and uh, cloud services. And that's why we decided to invest uh, at this time in uh, commercial support, because we have digital business running. Um, we have lots of interest in my company. We have business critical applications. And we always say that this should be the time um, to invest in commercial support. And we did that a, a few weeks ago. We started um, creating an Arrow cluster. That's the abbreviation for Azure Red Hat OpenShift on Azure for our public cloud cluster. That's the customer facing one. And um, on-premise, we invested in, uh, in OpenShift or the, there is also a, um, um, uh, what was the name of that? OKE. Um, OpenShift Kubernetes engine. It's not OKD, it's OKE. Don't ask me why they are sounding so similar. Um, OKE is a, a version, um, it's, it's OpenShift. Um, in fact, uh, you have support, but not for everything. And we are not using all the features of OpenShift at the moment for all our environments. Um, and because of that, we chose, um, OKE for some clusters and OpenShift is then the full-fledged version for the services we need full support. And yeah, for the moment we are very happy with this decision. And uh, to conclude what I told you in this uh, presentation, I am absolutely thankful and uh, to, yeah, to have OKD um, during our journey, it helped us tremendously to launch our digital business. In our opinion, 
OKD is a great door opener for OpenShift in enterprises because you can have OpenShift uh, with zero risk um, to start your digital business. Yeah, you have the same user experience. Um, a few things are different uh, regarding upgrades because in OKD you only have um, a rolling distribution. This means that you, if something is fixed, it won't get um, backports. It's always going forward. In OpenShift you have several stable or fast channels. Um, and yeah, but if you don't need that, and for in the beginning you don't need that, yeah, to be honest, uh, then it's a fair deal to don't pay any fees um, and you have a full-fledged uh, great Kubernetes distribution. And I, I can, yeah, congratulate a Red Hat for the decision to have a community version of OpenShift in their program. Uh, because it's, as I said, I think it's a, a big door opener for their main product, OpenShift. I have to say thank you to everybody from the OKD community and Red Hat uh, who helped us in the last years that we came to this point. And uh, special thanks go to Vladimir Rutkowski, uh, Christian Glombeck, and Diane Muller. They always were um, very helpful and uh, yeah, Vadim, especially Vadim, is, uh, seems to be online 24-7 on Slack. And uh, without these guys, uh, we would not have managed the first steps with OKD4. And thank you all. This is our, yeah, this was our journey. It took us three years. Now we are absolutely experienced in Kubernetes. I can compile some modules on my own. Uh, we know the insights of of uh, OKD and uh, Kubernetes very good. Um, we help in the community um, in, in several projects. Um, thank you for watching and if you have questions I'm available in the chat. And that's a wrap. All right. Well, I think I think that was um, one of the, the best um, endorsements for participating in OKD and in the working group and getting um, your feet wet with OpenShift um, through the open source side of, of the thing. And one of the, the next talk um, that we're delivering here is um, uh, an initiative that's coming out of Anthem around health OS. And so there's um, two folks, uh, Bobby Samuel from Anthem and Frederick Kautz um, from ShareCare now. ShareCare um, just recently acquired Doc AI, um, which is where Bobby uh, uh, met Frederick. And um, this is a, a really interesting project because it incorporates so many upstream um, uh, other projects, Spiffy, Spire, Envoy, uh, Network Service Mesh, just to name a few of them. And um, they're gonna tell you a bit about this initiative and how um, Anthem is going about bringing together all of its end users and its customers and partners um, into this health OS um, initiative. So um, Chris, if you're ready, cue it up and um, let's let's take a look at what's going on um, in at Anthem uh, with their health OS initiative. Hi, my name is Bobby Samuel and I've got Frederick Kautz here with me. Um, and we're going to talk to you today about um, health OS and enabling uh, standards-based healthcare interoperability uh, using cloud native and zero trust. So first of all, I'm Bobby. Um, I work at Anthem. I lead up the health OS development as well as um, uh, Precision Insights. Frederick, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello. I'm Frederick Kautz. I am a director of software engineering at ShareCare, and I collaborate with Bobby and Anthem on zero trust and a variety of, uh, of architectures and systems. So the way we're gonna walk through this today is we'll start with the business case or the business challenge, and then we'll, we'll move into the technology. 
um, and then be here to answer any questions. So first of all, you know, what's what's the challenge? What's the what's the point of all this? So Health OS um, is something that we've created internally here within Anthem, and payers are seen as the middleman pain point across the ecosystem and causing abrasion across various user segments, whether it's provider, member, or even to other payers. Uh, but we also sit in a position where we have the richest longitudinal view of data, um, and that's whole health data about the person. So HealthOS helps us operationalize our health, health data to drive improved outcomes and reduce costs and um, overall you know, increases efficiency. So we'll talk to you about how we do that, but at the foundation of it all, HealthOS is a platform. It's a hub whose primary emphasis is interoperability um, and then driving world-class experiences um, and, and um, uses machine learning um, and AI to drive insights and also actions. So just to talk about the business architecture and how the pieces fit together, um, the, the, at the bottom, we've got the data layer, and that data layer, um, it focuses on integrations with EHRs. Uh, it's got payer and clinical data, and then our data about members um, or our uh, constituents is based on FHIR, or the FHIR standard. On top of that layer, and this is where we'll get into um, uh, cloud native and zero trust, but in, in that space, in the security layer, um, in our platform layer, we've got a number of things that are running and happening. Uh, so insights and action apps live here um, and are, are, are created here. We've got uh, tool sets or IDEs um, and tool sets to rapidly build, validate, and or deploy health apps. Um, and then this is where we'll talk about where we're implementing zero trust uh, to do workload identity management. And then on top of that, we've got interaction layer. So the, the cool thing about health OS is that, or one of the many things about HealthOS, um, is that whether uh, it's a UI UX that HealthOS manages or a UI UX that uh, someone else manages, whether it's a, another EHR um, or a homegrown app that we have, uh, those all plug into and have the benefit of connecting back into all of these health apps and back into the uh, place where we've got the, the rich data stores. So this is the ecosystem that we've been put, putting together with our client endpoint, um, client application endpoints to connect, as well as SDK, um, our SDKs to build and rapidly de uh, deploy apps. So in our ecosystem, what, what's the, what are we trying to do this for? And um, at Anthem, we have a number of partners we work with. We have a number of, of partners that we connect with in various lines of business. Um, but the big problem is, is they're not connected. Anthem's connected to them, but they're not connected to each other. And what this allows us to do is to connect all the apps to each other. So HealthOS allows us to connect to Anthem's data ocean. Um, it allows health apps, insights, and actions to run um, and connect all these different apps. So we bring our digital ecosystem together, um, and we bring our EMR systems together that we connect with, as well as internal systems that exist within Anthem. All of these things working together focused on better outcome for the, for the member. And so let me like zoom back out uh, into what's our ecosystem and where zero trust uh, kind of fits in. So um, we've put health OS in the center, once again, action apps and inside apps. So an example of an inside app would be uh, what benefits are covered by for Bobby, or does Bobby have this in his formulary, this this particular drug in his formulary, or treatment in his formulary? An action could be um, scheduling uh, um, an appointment. It could be uh, one-click prescriptions or uh, you know painless prior auth, one-click prior authorizations. And so those things run together, and then using zero trust connections, we connect to various clients like the desktop. Um, or it could be, and I'm going counterclockwise right now, but like the desktop, um, it could be on AI ML tooling that we've got running that we can make insights available, third-party health solutions, um, and then even to clients like uh, third-party clients like uh, Telehealth OS, uh, which Telehealth has seen a huge rise in popularity and usage um, due to the pandemic, uh, and then EMR apps or, um, or, or apps that 
that do payment acceleration, um, as well as just traditional EMR um, platforms like in large hospital systems, Epic, Cerner, Athena Health. Um, and all of these connected together, working together, once again, focused on our uh, members' health and improving the health of humanity. And so what we'll do is we'll dive a bit more into how we're putting all of these things together on a cloud native zero trust foundation to deploy this ecosystem. So Frederick, let me turn it to you. Thank you, Bobby. So before we jump into zero trust, let's talk a little bit about some security basics. Very often when you speak with a security or information security person, you'll often hear about the CIA triad. Uh, we actually look at four things now, but uh, the first three uh, in the CIA in the, is, is what traditionally people would look at. Those three are confidentiality, is the information protected against unauthorized viewing or access? Uh, we look at integrity. Has the information been modified in a way that was unauthorized? How do we protect it from being modified? We also look at availability. Is the information available when you need it to be? And there's a fourth thing that has been added in in more recent times called non-repudiation, which is how can you ensure that a entity that has performed a transaction cannot back out of that transaction. And there's multiple reasons for this, which could include at the business layer, how do you prevent fraud? How do you, how do you ensure that you can observe the system and know that that's what the state was uh, likely to be? It could also be based upon uh, trying to make sure that the uh, that when you're looking at security systems that you know exactly who you're connecting with and that it hasn't been swapped out with, with someone else. So in general, there's now four main categories that people tend to look at. There's a couple others that people will bring in as well, but these are the, the main four that you, that you tend to see. So in, using this particular framework, we then take a look at uh, what are the business requirements? What is the, what, what is it that we're trying to, to protect? What has changed? So when we look at, uh, at the zero trust space and why it's important, one of the things that we want to look at is what, is, what, is the, what are the previous assumptions that we've made and what is the reality that we're seeing today? What, is, what has changed? And the differences between that assumption and reality can be seen in the form of cyber attacks where people will perform data breaches, will run ransomware, denial of service attacks, uh, forging identities or so on. And the policies that we tend to apply in uh, from a regulatory or policy perspective may also end up falsifying some of those assumptions, they end up entrenching those assumptions in such a way that they can be difficult to respond to. So zero trust is about realizing that we have these gaps and then building up a new framework that is more flexible in order to allow for response to these type of, of conditions and to allow for additional controls to be put in in such a way that it enables other other parts of your organization, your digital organization or your developers to be able to make the changes necessary to meet your mission, but at the same time still maintain that control to hit your confidentiality, your integrity, your availability, and your non-repudiation goals. So what is zero trust? I, I try to distill it down into a, in, into a small image. And this is the simplest that I was able to find. In the, very, in, in the top half of this, you have perimeter defense, which is the common gold standard that you see within many environments. That is where you have a trusted network. In that network, you have your services. If you need to connect to another network, you may have a firewall that you put in between them in order to protect entities in one network in from entities in another network. But the problem is that if you end up in attack with an attacker in one of these networks, then there's a lot that they can do there, a lot of damage that can that can be done. In the zero trust model, instead what we say is, well, what if that network was not trusted? No, it's not implicitly trusted. Right? That doesn't mean the firewalls go away. It doesn't mean that you're that you're not trying to protect the network but it means you're no longer saying this network is the implicit thing in which we base our trust. So once you no longer trust your network, then you have to look at where you push the controls and the controls end up being at the services themselves. So if you look at the bottom half of this, you can see every service when it connects to something else has some form of a of, of something resembling a firewall, something that, that is a control 
that uh, that allows you to determine what do you want to send over those links to those other to those other devices. If an attacker enters into your network, again, that doesn't mean you're no longer at risk, but it's a yet another layer of security that you have that doesn't allow for implicit access to things simply because they're on the network. So to build our zero trust framework, we start with three main foundations. This is identity, policy, and automation. Identity is what is it that identifies your service? What is it that identifies your user or identifies your data? How do you know that what you're looking at is the thing that you're that you're looking for? How do you attest that identity? Policy is how do you develop the rules and apply those rules and enforce those rules across the across identity? From the automation perspective is how do we take this from Let's say you have a single system and you can put a person on that system to defend it. Uh, when you say, when you start to try to scale this out to a large number of systems, hundreds of systems, thousands of systems, tens of thousands of systems, you need to have automation in place that is able to help you assign the identity and enforce the policy, but also bring in things like observability so you can audit what's going on and to have controls over well, what the automation is capable of doing or what it's not able to do. So it ends up being three intertwined primary uh, pillars that uh, that have to be put together in order to build a zero trust framework. So we've been working on a reference implementation for this in a in the cloud native environment, and we focus around three primary things. So if you notice, I in the triangle, I actually made them link up so you can see identity. Uh, we're using Spiffy and Spire. For policy, we're using Open Policy Agent. For automation, we're relying heavily on things like Network Service Mesh. Now, these aren't the only things in, in the infrastructure, but they're, they're representative of the type of things that we're trying to accomplish. So we'll go over each of these in, in more detail soon. We also build this on top of uh, Kubernetes. We build it on top of systems like OpenShift, we build it. We we build in automation on the infrastructure side. We have GitOps style processes that we're bringing in, and underpinning all of this, you still need observability across the whole stack. You still need control over the over the whole stack. So it ends up becoming this this model that that this particular thing represents that all works in coordination to deliver the infrastructure that is part of HelpOS. So what Spiffy and Spire are is that they provide identities to your workloads. So most people are familiar with user identity. You put in your password, you log into a online service, you have that user identity. In this scenario, we're looking at workload identities. So every workload receives an X509 certificate. This is the same type of certificate that when you log into your bank, your bank will use an X509 certificate to identify who it is. So we're relying on the same type of, of primitives and principles in order to secure the workloads. When a workload connects to another, they use a new feature within TLS that is available in TLS 1.3 and presumably above as those are released, and that is mutual TLS. Mutual TLS is where your client is able to validate your server like you typically can from a web browser validating your bank, but simultaneously, the server is capable of validating the identity of the client. So you have this two-way validation that occurs within a trust domain. So we're able to create these identities that live within a trust domain that allow them to establish their identities. And these identities are constantly rotated out. Every hour they get rotated out, and by default, if you're using Spiffy and Spire, and every time that you assign a new certificate, you perform a verifiable attestation. And what we mean by that is that the system will ask for an identity. We will look at the properties of that system. You might have a TPM module that you're working with. You might have a, a identity document that is within AWS or within GCP or other similar systems that have some cryptographic material inside of them that help prove something about that system. So we are able to build our Spiffy identities with attestation that is rooted in these cryptographic materials from, from these type of systems. This also has a very nice effect because since we're performing this mutual attestation and validation between systems, 
in many scenarios, it reduces or also eliminates the need for long living bearer tokens. So in other words, you don't need to pass in a secret. The fact you're connecting in with a specific identity is enough for the system to recognize what type of a system it is and what type of policies need to be applied. In terms of policy, we're looking at things like open policy agent. An open policy agent allows you to, to consume the identities that are produced by a system like Spiffy and Spire and allows you to decide what is this system allowed to do? What, is, what, are, what are its capabilities that, uh, that it is able to fulfill? And when, when, you, when you create these particular systems, what we're, the properties we're looking for in, that led us to open policy agent is it has to be something that's human readable has to be something that is that meets the the look and shape of, of common policy. So in other words, you could have how do you classify data? How do you classify workloads? How can you say this system has PHI and and create defaults that say don't allow them to connect to systems that don't have PHI or vice versa? And then from there we can carve out patterns that the system is allowed to perform. In this example, we took this from openpolicyagent.org. So it's one of their it's one of their examples they have on their front web page. And you can see a request that says pet owners are allowed with a specific ID that is verified by the JWT, which, which is something that identifies the user cryptographically, is allowed to receive information or is allowed to make a request against uh, against this API in a specific way, if and only if the request comes from like say this is in front of a database, if and only if the request comes from a client that we, that or a workload that, that we have identified. So it gives us a, a lot of flexibility to define the exact type of shape and policies that, uh, that we want in a human readable way that also allows us to get this policy into Git. It allows us to to have code reviews on these policies, to share them with uh, with other stakeholders, so we can get their opinions on whether this policy meets their requirements or not, and it gives us that that change over time, so we can see how the policy has, has changed, when did it change, because it's all checked into into Git. We also rely on a new technology called Network Service Mesh. Network Service Mesh is another CNCF project that is looking to automate low-level networking systems. So we're looking at, if you're familiar with the OSI model, we're looking at layer two, layer three. We're looking at frames in ethernet and IP and other similar level areas. And what it does is it facilitates the underlay to services. So typically when you're running in Kubernetes, you'll often have multiple clusters you want to connect together in some way. And when you connect them, the assumption is there's, are, there's already connectivity established between both systems. What Network Service Mesh allows you to do is to acknowledge that there may not be a connection that's there, and you may need certain things in place in order to make that connection work. So this allows the operator to say, in order for this connection to occur, I needed to have a firewall, an intrusion detection system, needs to go through a certain VPN gateway, a certain VPN concentrator, so Network Service Mesh allows you to automate these processes through a cloud native API with native support from Spiffy and Spire and Open Policy Agent. And it provides you a cryptographic non-reputation of that connection chain. So in other words, in this example, we have on the left Health OS app going through a specific VPN gateway to a specific VPN concentrator to a specific health app. We can get the cryptographic identity of everything in between and see what is a system connecting through? Is it connecting through systems that we trust? Is it connecting through systems that, uh, that are required to? Do we have everything in here that we need in order to establish the connection by policy and enforce it on an ongoing basis? Finally, we look at GitOps. And a from a GitOps perspective, the workflow, this is more of a process side that is then committed in as a, uh, as a service. So from the process, you have a developer. The developer will make some form of a commit into the source code uh, system, such as Git. Then the CI CD system, your continuous integration system, will see those changes that have been put into Git and will then render them into the, your, your test environment, into your staging environment, your production environment. The every change 
goes through source through source control. Every change goes through Git, which gives us that audit auditability. It gives us that chain as to who made the who made the change. We also have control from the QA side. So, uh, in fact, through when you're looking at, at regulatory concerns in this space, it's it's important that your developers are not allowed to push into production. You have to have a separate group of people, a separate team that is able to look at what changes are there and decide whether or not those changes should hit production. So when you start looking at things that are PCI compliance or HIPAA compliance uh, systems, you tend to see this pattern uh, quite common so that uh, you don't have a single place or a single person who is able to push these type of things in. So the QA team is then able to determine at, at what rate and when something is promoted from testing to staging or staging to, to production. A really great example of a system that you can use to achieve this in your own infrastructure is Flux. So highly recommend that you go look at Flux and give it a try. It hooks up to GitHub and gives you that initial path towards automating in, in this style. So uh, with that, I wanna thank you all for joining us and learning a little bit about uh, Health OS and uh, Zero Trust. You please consider that like, these are the type of technologies that we're using. We're using OpenShift with Kubernetes. We're using Spiffy and Spire, Open Policy Agent, Network Service Mesh Envoy. Please join these particular communities. There's a lot of uh, things that you can work on in, in those particular spaces. And if you're interested in the type of things that we're working out, please reach out to either Bobby or I, and we'll help you navigate the uh, the path, whether it's coming to work with us directly or whether it's trying to work in the same area in your own industry. So please, uh, please come and join us. Uh, with that, we have time for questions and thank you very much. All right. I just All right. Auto -play. Then. I'm still auto playing. Is it still auto playing? Oh my goodness. Well, yes, um, of course, Ed because why would you follow settings? Yeah, well, you know, we'll we'll figure all the, the little details here out. And and I love um, this last talk was about it was a lot focused on the the health OS and the healthcare industry and that. Um, and the next couple of talks um, are two folks that I met um, via another industry initiative, albeit for um, telcos. Um, there was a project, uh, the Enterprise Neurosystem Initiative, um, which is being spearheaded by. America Movell, Verizon Media, Ericsson Research, and a bunch of other folks, along with some Red Hat support. Um, and out of that, we decided to, to launch a um, uh, OpenShift Commons gathering earlier this year on data science. And two of the talks that came out of that were really cool. Um, first of all, um, it, it, there probably isn't a talk here that doesn't mention AI or ML. So that's that's kind of the interesting thing. But this one, this first one by um, Ganesh Haritz um, at, from Verizon Media. And if you don't know Verizon Media, a while back ago, um, they um, acquired uh, Yahoo. Um, and so this, a lot of the folks from Yahoo were doing some of this work as well. So he's going to talk a little bit about that. But he's going to talk about building an edge intelligence application um, and what it took to do that. So there's lots of little pieces um, and parts in there. And then um, followed on by a really cool talk uh, by um, Paul McLaughlin from the same um, group of folks, the Enterprise Neurosystem Initiative folks, um, and that data science gathering. And he's even going to throw in a little VR and AR into it. So um, uh, let's let's cue up this first one, uh, Chris, and see um, what Ganesh has to say, and then follow it with Paul. Awesome, will do. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's fantastic to be here at the OpenShift Commons Gathering Data Science. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting era where we are starting to take a closer look at uh, how data and AI is going to transform a lot of our experiences. I'm Ganesh Harinath. I'm with Verizon, Verizon Media. Uh, I've been doing data and AI for a very long time, over a decade closely. And uh, an interesting paradigm shift that I started to see, we were building platforms which were very heavily AI-driven on the cloud. And uh, we're starting to see 
application demand where we have to start to move these capabilities onto the edge. So throughout the presentation, I'll be citing our experiences in terms of how we look at these applications, how we solve these applications using frameworks, platforms, and so on. But uh, most importantly, I feel very, very blessed to be part of this ecosystem where I am experiencing how the world would be transformed through AI for uh, better experiences, uh, performance, efficiencies, uh, around healthcare, and then so on. And uh, when you start to take a closer look at it, uh, moving forward five, 10 years, robotic arm surgery is going to be very, very normal. And what that means is a doctor from New York can perform a surgery on a patient in Los Angeles. To me, this is fascinating. And interestingly, when you take a closer look at what's required for all these things to happen, robotics is important. A virtual reality is very important. And artificial intelligence uh, is the foundation for this capability. And most importantly, we being part of Telco, 5G would enable to converge these technologies to make this capability a reality in uh, years to come. But when we start to uh, ground ourselves and then take a closer look at where we are today, what we are trying to do with ML and AI, a uh, uh, lot of applications that really require massive data on the cloud applying AI uh, to understand various aspects of the network was one of the area that I was very, very focused on. But uh, uh, looking forward, uh, industrial automation is a space where we are starting to uh, uh, understand, build capabilities and solutions uh, to the right. On the left, uh, autonomous cars. Uh, I'm fascinated. Uh, there's a long way to go. But uh, the autonomous car today can look at the car in front. But what needs to happen is to be able to really connect to 5G capabilities and apply AI to plan the entire route. And that's in play as well. And these are like uh, fascinating changes that we all are living through. And uh, interestingly, uh, the shift has been accelerated. But the way how I summarize my experience, uh, any application that we would actually touch, feel, see, uh, would be powered by AI. But it's also equally important that uh, aspects like uh, uh, AI bias should be taken into account when designing these applications. Now, to summarize how the application uh, shift is happening, when you take a closer look at any machine learning application, I'm sure we all know there is an aspect of uh, model training, which is very compute intensive, and there is aspect of inferencing. And in today's world, very easily we deploy both uh, training and inferencing on the cloud and have this ML AI experience directly from the cloud. But if there's one shift that we are actually starting to see, the demand of near real-time inferencing, and uh, now we are talking about inferencing in milliseconds, we are talking about inferencing in milliseconds at massive scale. You're, you're talking hundreds and thousands of inferencing happen, that, that needs to happen uh, within a very short duration. In order to accommodate this, uh, we are starting to see a paradigm shift, and that is moving the inference capability very intelligently and seamlessly from the cloud to the closest location where the need is. So some of the application, uh, if the inferencing is of the order of 10 to 25 milliseconds, that's just an estimate, then ideal, you deploy these inferencing onto the CDN edge. We VMG, we have CDN edge in 160 location. We are already in the process of enabling these uh, CDN edge with intelligence through a platform called Leo, which I would cite in a few minutes. And most importantly, there are a lot of applications which really need inferencing near real time at massive scale, and most importantly, highly real, reliable. In order to accommodate the uh, uh, factor of high reliability and also the act, uh, aspect of millisecond inferencing, uh, we have to start moving inferencing to a uh, two-year box is what I call. Now, uh, an important paradigm shift when we go back and uh, uh, start to understand uh, evolution of internet, 
in the very, very beginning, it used to take fairly long for pages to download when we access uh, yahoo.com from S Sydney, but magically capabilities like CDN uh, was enabled to cache content geographically in different locations. And this technology happened uh, uh, behind the scenes where a sudden change in human experience happened in terms of using the internet. Everybody started to have consistent experience of internet and CDN is magic. Uh, so today, when we start to take a closer look at how we want to deploy applications, uh, enabling the CDN edge to be able to deploy ML applications is very, very critical. And uh, there's a transformation or change that's actually happening in this area as well. Now, what are the applications uh, that are really being discussed right now and why really we would need uh, inferencing to happen uh, so near real time and what, what exactly is a big problem? There is another very important paradigm shift that we all, I'm sure, started to notice. Uh, up till until now, a lot of ML applications were actually primarily driven by signals from sensors. They're very two-dimensional, they're records. And there are billions of records. In, in fact, uh, the platforms that our team really uh, operate, uh, build applications, we ingest 100 billion records every day. But uh, it's very easy even to operationalize platforms which can ingest and process 100 billion records because you have that luxury to be deployed on the cloud. And most importantly, the inferencing aspect is on a two-dimensional record. And the shift is the video content from where we have to pick up intelligence, apply machine learning to surface insights and solve the problem. That's another huge paradigm shift. And uh, it's no exaggeration when I take a closer look at a lot of applications that come our way when we are starting to work on, majority of the applications are camera driven in, in, in space of factory automation. And what we are seeing right now is an example of factory automation where you have video cameras which is up, uh, under, observing the assembly line. And these feeds would be fed to a platform like Leo where you'd have applications which can understand the video signals, inference and alert if there are issues alongside other, uh, other sensory signals like temperature, current and other things. So, so factory automation uh, is a space or area where we are continuing to invest a lot in building applications and I call it a 2 you box. We have to deploy a 2 you box. We need a platform like Leo. We need applications staying closer to the edge that way we have that reliability, both in terms of high volume inferencing and also ensure that it is seamless and it's actually working uh, in a factory environment. And uh, 5G private definitely is going to play a big role to connect all these different sensors, uh, cameras and so on and route uh, signals and video streams to a platforms, a centralized platform which can ingest and uh, apply uh, artificial intelligence and start to surface insights to improve efficiencies, to avoid error near real time uh, without any material loss. And uh, this is an area uh, we Verizon are starting to heavily invest uh, I'm sure many of you know Verizon already has a company called Skyward, which was acquired a few years ago. Uh, they are into helping fly drones. Now, knowing Verizon has tens of thousands of cell towers, uh, having technologies like drone and computer vision and so on, it's, uh, it's very timely that we, we start to build applications instead of people climbing on the cell tower to understand issues with the towers and connections and so on. Fly drones to understand the issues around those cell towers. One, uh, it addresses a lot of uh, safety issues. Two, it addresses, uh, 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 there's a, there a lot of cost efficiencies uh, attributed as well. And most importantly, uh, with computer vision, you really see uh, a lot of insights where you can take corrective actions near real time. And uh, we're continuing to invest. And this is kind of a very vertical application. Today, you solve it for cell tower. Cell towers, you can retrain it to monitor oil pipelines, buildings and bridges, and then so on. I personally am very, very fascinated uh, about the uh, mission that we uh, embarked on. We are very, very early on, though. 
Uh, there's a lot of learning here, but uh, I'm sure uh, in months to come, we'll be able to operationalize products like what we are discussing right now. And uh, it really requires edge capability. Uh, the, the video streams coming near real time, inferencing on the edge, uh, and then being able to provide surface, uh, in, sur sorry, being able to surface insights to the person who's really uh, conducting the sur survey uh, of uh, the cell tower or an antenna. Now, how can we how can we solve all these things uh, efficiently? Is the term that I would actually like to use. When we take a closer look at uh, the next generation application, pretty much every application would uh, have an aspect of machine learning attached to it. But the very interesting difference between the application that are powered by machine learning and traditional applications uh, is the, app, uh, the machine learning applications are not uh, static. I can't say uh, the release is complete. This is an awesome application. You, you guys go ahead and then use it. We really have to start to monitor the model and have a process in place to really retrain the model to make it more re meaningful, relevant, and accurate on the ground. And that's a non-trivial problem. And uh, that's where we need to have an ecosystem that supports the next gen uh, building and deployment of next generation application. The ML-based applications can be transactional. I can't say I've deployed the application and I can't walk away. I need to provide tools and capabilities which can be used to ensure that these applications are meaningful over a period of time. And uh, that's very important on one side. On the other hand, be able to distribute the workload, the training workloads on the cloud and the inferencing workloads on the edge. In simple terms, I call the pink boxes and the blue boxes were deployed on the cloud. Now, eloquently, we have to separate these uh, pink boxes to the closest edge, which could be a CDN edge or a 2U box, which would empower you to build applications like uh, a, a drone vertical inspection, uh, applications like factory automation, and then so on. So we are very heavily invested uh, in operationalizing uh, uh, the capability of platform, which helps, empowers us to build uh, edge application seamlessly. So what you're seeing is a very high level blueprint of the platform Leo, uh, where the pink boxes are taken care of as part of uh, the model inferencing and application deployment. And this application deployment has to be end to end. We should be able to run UI. It has to be secured. And uh, this to me is a paradigm shift. We all talk about a distributed infrastructure now we are talking about a distributed application where uh, the same drone inspection, the same factory automation has to be deployed in multiple location. And in many cases, it has to be integrated on the cloud to make it work very, very seamlessly. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, time uh, where the demand for infrastructure is changing. The security posture is changing. Uh, we just can't say we have an awesome cloud uh, uh, infrastructure in multiple locations. Uh, it's micro clouds, and these micro clouds have to be connected to the parent cloud, primarily because your application loads are distributed on the edge and on the cloud with seamless interconnect. And what you're seeing is a reflection of our view uh, about a year and a half ago, and today what, what you're seeing is real. So Leo is a glue between various technology infrastructures, platforms, uh, and integration between data sensors and so on, which will enable and empower to build different applications like drone inspection, factory automation, digital twin that has been operationalized for Verizon's own good within Verizon. And I'm sure we all have our own strategies, but uh, I'm very excited and encouraged to share uh, the success that we are actually starting to see uh, about uh, uh, understanding the needs of the edge platform and uh, uh, ironing out the capabilities that are actually needed on, on, on the edge. Now, in a nutshell, when you take a closer look at uh, Leo, you can build an end-to-end -end application on Leo, which can ingest data, which can apply inferencing at massive scale on the edge, 
and uh, be able to uh, deploy any machine learning model. And most importantly, this is container based. So what that translates to is it can be deployed on any uh, uh, edge platform. But as I was mentioning, it's very important to have a seamless interconnect to the cloud because it's just only portion of your application. And a lot of the training needs to happen on the cloud and that there could be compliance policies where you have to persist data on the cloud. And this data has to be shipped onto the cloud for various reasons. And uh, most importantly, a fascinating uh, approach of building models. This is called distributed uh, model training, uh, which can be consolidated on the cloud, can be approached through platforms like Leo. Now, at a very high level, uh, for us, when you take a closer look at uh, what are the capabilities that we would need on the edge, data management is super important, be able to ingest data, all forms of kinds of data, high throughput, and so on. And it should uh, empower us to build end-to-end -end applications with UI, very secure, and so on. And most importantly, the security posture has changed because you have a 2U box uh, sitting somewhere. Physical security becomes important. Application security becomes important too. These things have to be factored in, This, which is beyond Leo, but we need to have a strategy to address all aspects of security. And Leo does address application security. We would have to depend on uh, uh, edge enablement capabilities uh, like OpenShift as well in this case to ensure that it is seamless. We can control or manage the container seamlessly on the edge uh, and also provide a very secure environment to deploy edge applications. And most importantly, uh, have a strategy in place where you have components where you can deploy models, seamlessly manage it, monitor it, uh, and uh, most importantly, perform near real-time uh, analytics too. And everything that I have said uh, is part of Leo. It's operationalized, and we have been very, very successfully been using within uh, Verizon. Uh, and interestingly, though it's very, very early, Leo has become the North Star Edge architecture for Verizon Media Group as we speak. Now, to conclude, uh, we are starting to see a, a, a new influx of application. I call this as next generation application. And these applications, each one of them would be powered by AI, uh, there's no doubt. Uh, they're poised to enhance human experience and efficiencies and health and safety and so on. But the paradigm shift from the infrastructure perspective is we have to understand and identify the components that have to be moved closer and closer to the edge. It could be a CDN edge or a 2U box. Now, I think with that, uh, the way how I would like to summarize a lot of uh, the stories and experiences that I have explained, uh, uh, it's it's a very very it's going to be very very interesting as we move forward. Primarily, as you start to take a closer look at building uh, ML and AI based applications, uh, it's complex. We have to find ways to simplify this through a platform strategy. We need to have a strategy and partnerships in place where we have control on the edge and uh, uh, technologies like OpenShift definitely will put us in a very, very good situation to have a very controlled and manageable uh, environment taking into account it's very, very distributed too. Uh, and most importantly, how are we going to build, test, deploy, keep the environment very agile, that way it's adaptive, adaptive too. So, uh, uh, so taking all these things into account, we're very early on. Uh, we have our own experiences. Very happy to uh, learn your experiences too, uh, connecting offline. Uh, and also, I'm starting to look up to consortiums like a Neurosystem. I'm, I'm really excited and happy to be part of it. And also, I feel very blessed to be part of an ecosystem like this. While we bring in what we know, uh, primarily from experience perspective in terms of solving problems on the edge, uh, building ML and AI applications for Verizon, Verizon Media, 
and other enterprise customers that we are starting to work with. Uh, we're here to learn uh, as part of the ecosystem and become more and more efficient uh, as we continue to build our next generation applications, uh, which I envision would change a human experience, which would improve efficiencies. And also most importantly, uh, I am excited about uh, the security posture, improving security posture, and also uh, health and safety too. So with that, I sincerely thank you all very much uh, for this opportunity uh, and uh, look forward to uh, sync up with you offline as part of consortiums and then we can take it from there. Most importantly, uh, stay safe. Uh, I'm sure we are all going to have a fantastic and uh, terrific 2021. Thank you. All right then. So next up. Yeah, next right up. There. yeah I'm right. I'm, I'm okay. right here. Uh, next up, we have uh, Paul McLaughlin from Ericsson Research, who um, was also part of the data science uh, gathering earlier this year, and um, he's got a, he did actually the keynote for us, and so it's quite an interesting talk, um, melding sustainability, machine learning, um, augmented reality, VR, and 5G. Sorry. So, it, and and really, one of the focuses um, Paul has is really about doing using AI for good, and I, I thought that was a great um, theme for this. So I'll let you cue that up, uh, Chris, and we'll move right right into that. Got it. Good afternoon. I'm Paul McLaughlin. I'm AI research. And the screen is black. Fun. We'll get there. Oh, maybe. Later. Yes. All right. Well, it's not playing nice. Did the YouTube video itself? Now it like OBS wasn't able to see it. So hang on while I try to open a new window with the video in it and we get it to show up. Yeah. Hmm. That's really weird. There we go. All right. Sorry for the technical difficulties, folks. Good afternoon. I'm Paul McLaughlin. I'm AI Research Leader, and I'm part of Ericsson Research based in Santa Clara, California. Today, I'm going to be talking about how Ericsson is using AI to help address sustainability and climate change. because we know that climate change is real and having devastating impacts now. Humans have caused one degree centigrade of global warming above pre-industrial levels. And NASA and NOAA say that 2020 was the second hottest year on record globally. Climate change is causing extreme weather events, which are the most visible effect of climate change. But the frequency of extreme weather, like wildfires, droughts, hurricanes, tornadoes, thunderstorms is increasing in the United States. And in 2019, extreme weather cost $45 billion in the United States alone. 
This also has pretty important societal impacts because climate change damages hit low-income Americans in the South hardest, and minorities and people of color bear a disproportionate share of the climate change burden. The time to act is running out. So what do we need to do? The carbon law teaches us that emissions must be cut by half every decade to reach net zero by 2050. So by 2030, the information and communication technology sector can have a massive impact towards that goal. In 2020, 54 gigatons, which is a billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions came from the ICT sector. So following the carbon law to avoid catastrophe, emissions needed to have peaked last year. And between 2030, the 2020 and 2030, we need to have a further 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and for every decade following that until 2050. At the same time, we also have to invest in carbon sinks like forests to help capture some of the carbon we've already emitted. Action is required right now. Otherwise, the longer we delay, the bigger and faster reduction is required. Digitalization though is an exponential technology which will help us address this target even more quickly. Ericsson research indicates that the ICT sector can enable reductions in global and greenhouse gas emissions by 15% globally. And this is based on existing ICT technology. More opportunities to go exceed that 15% will likely be enabled by technologies like 5G and machine learning and AI that Ericsson is investing in heavily. We see a particularly big impact on the energy, industry, and transportation sectors, which I'll be walking you through some examples, as well as speaking to my own research on AR and VR and how that will help address uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But the main point is that decarbonization solutions ex exist today. We don't need to wait for a silver bullet. And the estimated financial benefit of low carbon is 26 trillion dollars by 2030 for reference. So we have an incredible opportunity ahead of ourselves. So Ericsson is leading the way and we are reducing emissions and impact of our company's activities, our products and services, and this also will have a dramatic impact on society. And so our goal is to be carbon dioxide neutral by 2030, which speaks to our company's impact. And this includes fleet vehicles and facilities that our goal is for 5G to be 10 times more efficient than 4G, which speaks to the impact of our products. Because 30% of network OPEX today comes from energy consumption, and 90% of mobile network operator emissions are from network power. So for example, we are building a smart factory in Louisville, Texas. Uh, we are pursuing lead gold and lead zero carbon certifications, and 90% of the materials for that factory will be diverted from landfill. landfill. We've installed 1,600 solar modules, and we produce over a million kilowatt hours annually, which is enough to power 93 U.S. homes for a year. We have water recapture uh, tanks, so we can capture and reuse rainwater. Uh, which is enough for us to, uh, enough water for one U.S. home for 133 days. So this is an example of how Ericsson is actually investing to ensure that our products uh, are sustainable and helping us show how manufacturing can transition towards a low carbon future. We also want to reduce the impact of digital networks. So the ICT sector's carbon footprint is estimated to be 1.4% of the global total. One thing I really want to point out, because I think it's remarkable and it shows how we are using technologies like AI today, is that emissions have remained constant while data traffic has quadrupled and the number of subscribers has increased by 30%. And one of the main reasons for that is because we've seen big energy efficiency gains from technology shift, uh, from the technology shift from desktop and laptop to handheld. But the ICT sector has decarbonization solutions that can get us to, they can help lead to a 50% energy reduction or emission reduction by 2030. So things like renewable electricity to power networks, 
The ICT sector today is the largest purchaser of renewable power. Mobile network efficiency, where we can see Ericsson's leadership uh, role in innovation. Uh, but we worry that energy consumption will increase dramatically if 5G is deployed like 3G and 4G were. So Ericsson's technology leadership is breaking this energy curve. Uh, hardware modernization can drive up to 30% reduction in power with higher data throughput, and software can drive up to 50% reduction in power with no impact to consumers. This allows operators to decouple mobile data traffic growth from energy consumption and carbon emissions. We're also transforming transportation. So transportation emissions constitute 60% of the global total or 8.6 gigatons of CO2 per year. Commercial transport powered by renewable electricity is critical for decarbonization. And a robust 5G innovation platform will be required for this future, for further development of this technology. A fully built out 5G network will be required to operate autonomous vehicles at a massive scale. So the challenge is, how do, how do we provide affordable and safe transportation and reduce greenhouse gas emissions? And an example of solution of this is Ericsson, a Swedish startup called Einride, and Swedish mobile operator Telia created an electric and autonomous transportation system that is safer and more sustainable. And the impact is that Einride says electric vehicles powered by renewable uh, renewables reduce carbon emissions of, of a logistics network by up to 90%. Autonomous driverless commercial vehicles also have less downtime, more, more reliability, and lower total cost of ownership, and will also lead to better air quality. So how does 5G fit in? Uh, 5G enables higher speeds, lower latency, and increased reliability for the, for the network and capacity. We also think the digital divide is a critical component to sustainability as well, because the digital divide is most pronounced in rural and minority communities. Today in the United States, 37% of rural students lack adequate connectivity and this has really critical impacts as schools are closed during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you lack connectivity, you cannot attend e-learning. And according to Deloitte, the digital divide currently costs the United States economy $130 million a day. So as an example of how Ericsson is, is tackling this problem, uh, the Rutland City Public School System partnered with Vermont Telephone and Ericsson, and we installed next generation 4G and 5G wireless radios and antennas in fewer than 10 days. So Vermont Telephone delivered modems and routers, which connected students to e-learning. Rutland City Public Schools delivered Google Chromebooks that have wireless connectivity, and this happened in not in weeks or months, but in less than 10 days. And homes in Rutland now have wireless speeds well above 10 meg 100 megabits per second, which enables students now to access world-class education and e-learning opportunities. And Ericsson is committed to this globally, so we are partnering with UNICEF to make this possible globally for students around the world to really bridge that digital divide. We also think that 5G will help enable a transition to renewables. So the United Nations says that by 2050, 80% of all the world's power needs to come from renewables. And this will help us get to that decarbonization that is critical for climate action. So the challenge for renewables to scale up is that there's a large number of power generators, multiple solar panels and wind farms, and bi-directional energy distribution, power sold and purchased from a grid as needed, and we have fluctuations in power generation because renewables can sometimes be unpredictable. There may not be wind one day. So the solution to this problem is smart grids. More renewables means the distribution system operators need total control of power distribution networks. And distribution system operators need to respond rapidly to balance power production and load to avoid outages. So the role of 5G is that distribution system operators see digitalization and connectivity as key enablers in transition to renewable power. 
distribution system operators recognize cellular tech connectivity, offers lower capex compared to cabling for grid communications, and real-time power system management requires low latency communi uh, communication connection. Uh, and we can reduce interruptions by up to 75% with ICT compared to today's level, according to a Swedish uh, distribution system operator. Digitalization is also critical for the industrial sector. So the industrial sector currently accounts for 32% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And the challenge to decarbonizing this is that the industrial sector needs to meet consumer demand while cutting emissions by 50% by 2030. So business as usual is not sustainable, and we have to transition from linear to circular business models, which is what we think of as industry 4.0. And the role of connectivity and industrial process optimization is vast. So by 2024, 5G will cover 65% of the global population, and there will be 4.1, or we believe there will be 4.1 billion cellular IoT connections. And so that ubiquitous connectivity enables real-time measurement and real-time AI of industrial processes on a massive scale. The exponential roadmap shows that up to 20% reduction in annual energy intensity po is possible by real-time monitoring of processes, things like AI and energy use, and the AI itself will help us get to continual optimization of processes. So Ericsson is using connectivity in our smart factories today in Tallinn, uh, Estonia, and in the United States to implement use cases to increase efficiency and reduce our own carbon emissions. So we're showing how this can be done today. But the role of connectivity is really critical in enabling the circular economy because it, it increases the lifetime of products and enables reuse. For example, 60 to 75% of energy can be saved by using recycled instead of new steel and material reuse needs to grow. Digitalization can track materials and products from manufacturing and reducing waste by asset tracking, uh, tracking can ha really help during logistics as well. So I wanna pivot and talk about some of my own research because I was speaking to you a lot about it, er, uh, how Ericsson sees tackling this challenge across the industry, across all the industries we partner with and how connectivity plays a role. But the team I work on works on augmented and virtual reality, which are technologies that will help bring uh, full experiences to people. And we are thinking of this as it relates to carbon emissions, sustainability. And I'll give you an example. Air travel today uh, contributes to 2.5% of global CO2 emissions. And just a single round trip flight between New York and London produces 6 0.67 tons of carbon dioxide per passenger. While a lot of travel is incredibly important, and it's something I personally love because I love to have the sense of being in a place, the smell, the taste, the sounds of a uh, taste of food, the sounds of the environment. But a lot of travel today is to take a tour of a factory or look at a demo of a product or shake an, a person's hand so they can conclude a business meeting. But what if I told you that we are working towards a vision using AI, 5G, and a lot of in critical hardware research to enable people to have that same tactile experience from their own home. I'd like to show you a video about that.
I get goosebumps every time I see that video. So our vision at Ericsson Research is that by 2025, we will be able to have advanced technology that will allow people to have full five sensory immersive experiences across a mobile network. And we think our vision by 2030 is for people to be able to share things such as memories or thoughts using brain computer interfaces. One of the critical challenges that we are trying to solve using AI is spatial computing. So for us to have interactive content and experiences, we have to use AI to understand the physical environment around the user and the objects in those environments. And that means creating things like spatial maps and environmental understanding, but also enriching those spatial maps with semantic information. So not only do we know where an object is located or where buildings are located, we also know what types of objects they are, what the relationship the end user has with those objects. And this will really enable us to create that full five sensory content and experience. Because once we have that information, we can then generate overlays. And so these overlays are critical uses for AR and VR. So here as an example is what you might see through your headset when you go to pick up your rental car uh, in the future. So in order to place this overlay on top of your rental car with your return date, the price per day and the like, we have to understand the object, we have to understand the environment, we have to do this incredibly rapidly because users can experience uh, what we call virtual reality motion sickness if there's any delay greater than about 40 to 50 milliseconds. So this means we have to process data transmitted across the network or on the device itself and get a response within less time than it takes you to blink. So that's one of the key and critical challenges that we are working on in my team and why we're excited for the latency for 5G. Because that content placement is extraordinarily computationally complex. And we worry that people will not have that same, the same quality of experience unless we can have that computation at the edge, but also to have the speed and latency for the algorithms for the network uh, so that all the overlays, the content, the entertainment that you see through your AR and VR headsets uh, are correctly placed and are personalized for you. This is a challenge though, because it also requires AI, it requires mobile network, it also requires headsets. And XR headsets or AR and VR headsets today are evolving rapidly. So today, there aren't any commercially available headsets that have embedded 5G chips inside of them. So that means that headsets and these experiences are not fully mobile yet, if you'll forgive the pun. AR and VR headsets cannot, without 5G chips, cannot push connectivity and data processing over the network unless they're connected to Wi-Fi. So in that example I just showed you in the car rental pickup garage, the challenge will really be that without 5G or network connectivity, uh, we may not be able to get to calculate that overlay of without, unless you're connected to Wi-Fi. Once we have 5G chips inside of the headsets, people will be able to take this level of computation and interactivity with them wherever they go. And we also think that not only will 5G help address the mobility aspect, it solves a lot of the technical problems or it addresses a lot of the technical problems that are inherent uh, in spatial computing. So for example, one millisecond end-to-end -end latency is the standard for 5G. And that dramatically reduced headset, that dramatically reduced latency means that headsets can work with real-time data. So that means as objects or the environment changes in the, in the end user's field of view, we can track objects, we can correctly track overlays so that content and overlays in XR move with the environment and move with the end user. And 20 gigabits per second down speed, 10 gigabits per second up speed means we may not have to compress content or video as much so not only will you have content that reacts in real time, it will look real as well because we may not have to compress it as significantly. This will also really help with spatial computing because it will improve the accuracy and precision of environmental understanding algorithms like simultaneous localization and mapping. We also are really excited about the possibilities of 
edge computing for spatial computing. So pushing data processing uh, to the edge of the network really will enable rich experiences and immersive experiences that are mobile as well. And with edge computing, one millisecond uh, data travels at the speed of light. So one millisecond means that an edge computing facility can be located upwards of 50 miles from the end user. But we're also working to be able to think of how to make smaller edge facilities. It can be located even closer to the end user, which will really help us address that latency challenge for machine learning and AI. So if we can, for example, think about how to uh, distribute where data is processed, that will really help us reach that latency ceiling that is critical for quality of experience for AR and VR. And that 5G really means that the headsets and the form factors we will see are evolving rapidly. So if we can offload computing into the edge of the network or across the network, it means we can see, and we are starting to see, smaller headsets that have a physical form factor that is lighter and smaller in size. Once 5G radios are inside of these headsets, we'll be able to process and experience AR and VR content outside of the home that updates in real time with that incredible latency from 5G and the speed. Once we push processing into the edge of the network as well, we'll see longer battery life, or we believe we will see longer battery life because we will probably need fewer chips on, on the actual headsets. We don't need to have uh, ASICs that consume quite a lot of, of battery. So we will see people be able to wear their headsets all day long like they use their cell phone today. And the key piece I think is the most exciting for me is around collaboration. Because without connectivity, without 5G, and frankly without AI as well, people can't have a really difficult time collaborating. So if we wanted to have a business meeting in person or look at a product demo together, uh, it will be a challenge to make sure that we are seeing the same thing at the same time and to interact with it so we can change things and collaborate together, play games together, watch entertainment together. That's what the latency from 5G and the mobile network connectivity will enable is that collaboration. And just to give you a couple of examples, this is the Lenovo A3. So these are uh, headsets that are commercially available today. And we're already starting to see a dramatic change in the physical form factors. And this is an Nreal. So we are seeing headsets for AR and VR that are starting to look a lot like the glasses I'm wearing today. And that's our vision for how a, uh, and our vision is that the internet of senses is coming. And our vision, as I said, is for this to be have the technology in place by 2025 to enable full sensory internet and connectivity. And so as you can see in this image, we may tackle sustainability by needing, removing the need to travel and meet in person. So here we see a person having a business meeting with someone at, with a hologram. And because of the placement, because of the connectivity and latency from 5G, that hologram is able to travel with the person. You can share a secret and whisper, and you can shake that hologram's hand and feel the weight of their hand. So I really want to thank you for your time, for listening to me. The message I really want to impart you with is that climate change is real. It is critical that we address it. And every day that we wait, the problem gets a little bit harder to solve. But by solving climate change, like Erickson takes very seriously, it's not, a, it's not a solution or it's not a problem that has no solutions. Using existing technology, we can already get 15% reduction in greenhouse gases. And we at Ericsson think we can go even further than that. And we are really excited to be on this journey with you. Thanks so much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, all right. Um, and, and and I love that, and that means I'm going to probably have to upgrade my Oculus Rift um, yet again to get the Internet of Senses there and to get uh, VR with um, sensory things. Mostly I feel sensory deprived right now when I'm in my uh, VR headset stuff. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> Dude, are, are you one of the unfortunate people that gets, like, seasick? Uh, well, you know, he did mention that little bit of a lag time. You know, mm -hmm. And when you get that lag time, you definitely do it. The only time I ever do it is when we are using the Google Earth app in VR. And then- That'll I do, do it. it. 
nausea because you're flying over stuff. And there's there's one game, I can't think of it, but that gives me that. But it's really interesting to, to listen to how, um, because that talk really, you know, didn't he didn't go deep diving into what the infrastructure was underneath the, the underneath it or the Kubernetes or the OpenShift or but for me what's interesting it keeps running through is all the um, AI and ML workloads that are running on OpenShift and the thread of you know how people are leveraging um, the Red Hat technologies that we're we're um, enabling so that that's really cool and the next talk that we're queuing up um, came from the most recent uh, Red Hat Summit Part Two in June. Um, and Isa Bank, which is out of Turkey, um, did a, a wonderful talk about um, enabling GPU usage for machine learning with OpenShift and also talked about their Ceph storage stuff. But um, one, I wanted to give a huge shout out for them because they went to massive lengths to record this talk during COVID epidemics and everything else. And um, I really appreciate that. Um, and I think it might be the first time that they were on stage anywhere at Red Hat as well, the isobatic folks. So um, really cool. They talk about AI, ML, some big data, data management, analytics. Um, and um, they had already been doing a lot with CI, CD pipelines um, and using lots of third party products. But this talk really talks about how they brought all that together. And um, I'm not gonna steal their thunder, but I'm gonna let you cue it up, Chris. Um, okay. and then we'll have one more talk after this because I think we're running up to our time limit at noon and then we'll queue up the, um, the remainders at a later date. So um, thanks everybody for, for hanging in here with us today while we figured out this, uh, this platform and how to use it properly for all this stuff. So thanks again. There you go, Chris. All right. Hello, everybody. In this session, together with my colleagues, uh, we would like to summarize how we enable GPU usage uh, for machine learning on top of OpenShift and Ceph uh, storage infrastructure. Uh, my name is Yener. I am responsible for container and uh, Kubernetes platform in Ishbank. I will give some brief information about uh, our OpenShift and Kubernetes journey. But first, uh, let me uh, let me give some brief information about uh, Ishbank. Uh, Ishbank is the largest private bank in Turkey. We have two, uh, 20 million customers, uh, 1,250 branches, and approximately uh, 25,000 employees in Turkey. Uh, for IT uh, depart uh, department, uh, we have uh, 550 uh, employees. For data management team, uh, we have 200 uh, employees, and for software development teams, uh, we have 1,400 uh, employees. Uh, in IT systems, we handle 200,000 transactions per day. Uh, more than 85% uh, uh, of these transactions are coming from uh, mobile applications. Uh, we are operating uh, 900 uh, applications and 10,000 VMs uh, in uh, IT infrastructure. And uh, right now we have accumulated 13 petabytes of uh, active data. In, 2000, in 2017, we have migrated to our new data center, which is named uh, as Atlas. Atlas is recognized uh, as, the as the first and uh, only data center in Turkey with the highest uh, resilience level, uh, res resilience level tier four operations called. Then we have created a secondary secondary data center in Ankara for both active active workloads and uh, disaster recovery purposes. Uh, our uh, container and uh, orchestration journey started started in uh, late uh, 2017. We have created an initiative name, named as Koli. Uh, there were members from 10 different teams from uh, both IT and uh, development teams. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Kubernetes have, uh, has become the de facto standard uh, of orchestration. Uh, with this team, uh, we, have, uh, we have studied most of the uh, CNCF Kubernetes distributions and 
for the best three candidates, we have concluded uh, our POCs. At the end, at the end of this POC uh, studies, uh, OpenShift was selected as our orchestration platform. Uh, uh, we have installed uh, version 3.11 uh, and integrated uh, this version 3.11 OpenShift uh, with our existing DevOps toolchain. Uh, for DevOps toolchain, uh, we are using Azure DevOps, Xavier Labs uh, release and deploy products, Sonata Nexus, uh, Elastic Stack, and our custom uh, in-house built uh, architecture tools named Haber and Genome, and in-house monitoring and other systems. And, and after that, uh, we have purchased essential tools like Tristlock, Cluster, and Ceph. And for, uh, for, uh, for OpenShift version 4, uh, we have obtained uh, OpenShift cluster storage as our uh, storage uh, solution. In January uh, of this year, uh, we started studying uh, with OpenShift version 4. Uh, we used bare metal installation with restricted uh, network. In both version 3 and version 4, we are using uh, bare metal servers for AI and machine learning work workloads and virtual machines for uh, other workloads. For OpenShift weather, uh, version 4 migration, uh, Red Hat offered uh, CSA engagement. Uh, CSA means Cloud Success Architect. Uh, we have been working with the team, CSA team, for about two months uh, for preparing our uh, version 4 clusters for production and for also migration. Uh, we are happy with the CSA team and with their, with their work. Uh, we started the actual migration process at the begin beginning of uh, May. Uh, we use our DevOps pipeline for migration and migrating applications one by one. At the time of the recording, uh, we have completed 15% uh, of uh, project migration. Uh, and at last, this slide shows what we have gained from OpenShift. Uh, Self-service provisioning of compute storage and network components saved, saved us uh, a lot of time. Before Office Shift, it was taking days or weeks to get the required components. But now it takes uh, seconds to deploy uh, all of the uh, application components. Uh, and second, it was very easy to integrate it with our custom DevOps tools. Uh, and third uh, gain is uh, our application development speed and uh, deployments uh, increased by uh, 15 uh, to 20 percent. Uh, and at last, uh, OpenShift uh, provided us uh, secure, in, uh, secure environments by default. Uh, and from the following slides, my colleague Suhal will give uh, brief information about Ceph storage infrastructure. Hello, uh, my name is Suha, 19 Mayıs. Uh, I'm responsible for the uh, storage backup uh, server and virtualization uh, infrastructures within the bank. So today uh, I would like to uh, summarize the Red Hat Ceph storage and OpenShift container storage and how we utilize uh, these products within the bank. Uh, so uh, before jumping into technical details of uh, the Ceph infrastructure, I would like to give brief information about the business requirements. So uh, the main requirement for us uh, is the S3 endpoint. Uh, so S3 uh, and S3 protocol uh, is an Amazon protocol, uh, which is uh, kind of a de facto standard nowadays. And not only the public cloud, but also the uh, the, the on-premise uh, private cloud environments also requires S3 endpoint. And the second biggest uh, requirement from us uh, for the OpenShift uh, platforms, like my colleague Yener uh, mentioned, uh, the OpenShift container platforms uh, utilizes OpenShift uh, container storage for OpenShift person volume uh, needs. And uh, the, the, the third requirement was the multi-site configuration. Uh, so uh, the, all the data, all the objects which is written into uh, Ceph uh, is uh, replicated bidirectionally between two sites. 
And also the storage infrastructure needs to be redundant, available and sustainable all the times. So you don't have a chance to, uh, you know, put the uh, storage uh, infrastructure uh, down and, you know, provide the maintenance during that. Uh, so uh, Ceph is redundant, available and sustainable all the times, which allows you to do such uh, maintenance jobs. And uh, uh, the other requirement was the bucket notification. So uh, as of today, uh, Ceph uh, allows you to use uh, AMQP, Advanced Messaging Queuing Protocol, HTTP endpoint, and Kafka for bucket notification. Uh, I will get into the details for that. Uh, and auditing. Uh, so whenever or whoever uh, accesses the objects within the Ceph uh, storage environment, you need to audit all these access requirements. Uh, last but not least is the bucket lifecycle managing management. So uh, you need to tear down or tear up uh, all the objects uh, within the cluster so that uh, you will manage the cost and you will manage the performance in a required way. So uh, these are the main business requirements for us to put uh, object storage uh, and software defined storage within the bank. So just after the business requirements, uh, I would like to summarize uh, the Ceph architecture on each side. Uh, this is a brief summary of the topology. Uh, so we have, at, as, uh, as my colleague uh, mentioned about it, we have two data centers and two sites. So uh, for the tier four data center, uh, we are using uh, three different rooms uh, and we are replicating the data in a 3x uh, replication factor for each object. So uh, within these rooms, thanks to crash hierarchy, uh, so we have placed uh, all the servers, which consist of the OpenShift, uh, which consist of the OpenShift container storage, within a different rack on each room, and you will see all the services which is running on top of those, and uh, all the services like Mons managers and MDS demons are running containerized, by the way, and they are all running on a Docker containers uh, on top of these servers, and uh, you will see public and cluster network. So uh, just after we have introduced the SSD disks within the cluster, uh, the public and cluster network utilization uh, really increased in a uh, very high fashion. You need to uh, keep an eye on those because uh, the cluster network, which uh, distributes data across all these nodes is uh, heavily utilized just after introduced the SSDs. And uh, you need, we are using Jumbo frames, by the way, which is quite critical for us. Uh, the message transfer units, the MTUs, is uh, 9,000 as of today, uh, which gives us uh, additional performance benefits. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, this is the uh, only, this is the architecture for each site. And since we have uh, two data centers, we have an identical self cluster installations on each site. So uh, I would like to mention about the backend architecture as well. Uh, so uh, we have two different uh, uh, we have two different domain names, which is uh, running uh, just uh, just uh, under the uh, F F five load balancers. Uh, the primarily uh, the red one is uh, serving the internal requirements, where the application needs to access or write or retrieve the data uh, within the self storage. Uh, is accessing the cluster in a uh, from a different namespace, and the green one, which you will see, uh, is for applications which is uh, which needs to access uh, the self storage from outside of the bank. Uh, so these these two namespaces uh, are behind uh, different F5 load balancers. So in total, we have 40 Rados gateways. Uh, so all the Rados gateways are diversified. Uh, so that for different type of workloads, we'll use different type of Rados gateways. We isolated all these requirements. Uh, so uh, in summary, uh, this is the backend architecture where we are accessing the uh, Ceph uh, clusters and objects uh, just underneath the cluster. So in summary, we have approximately 1.5 petabytes of row capacity and approximately 430 terabytes of this is SSD and 1.1 petabyte of is, uh, is, is SATA drives. Uh, so uh, we are managing this uh, within two regions. Uh, 
uh, as I mentioned, two different data centers located in two different cities in, within six rooms, uh, 18 commodity servers with uh, 432 uh, OSDs, excluding the block DBs or SSDs, uh, which is, you know, uh, working for uh, the Blue Store. And uh, as uh, all Rados gateways are containerized, and uh, so uh, multi-site DMZ and production Rados gateways uh, are running uh, by their own, which is which serves uh, to different workload needs. And in total, within the cluster, we are managing more than 400 million objects within 15 pools and approximately 4,000 placement groups and with three crash rules. And by the help of this crash rule, as we discussed, uh, we are using them for bucket lifecycle management and so that you can create custom rules to move objects uh, across different pools in order to uh, have the cost benefit out of it. So uh, I would like to give you some brief information about the use cases. Uh, so uh, we are we have integrated the OpenShift container storage uh, with OpenShift container platform, and uh, where this container storage uh, is being utilized by eight OpenShift, eight different OpenShift clusters. Uh, we have conducted many POCs uh, just before choosing OpenShift Container Storage. And as well as we uh, tried the vendors that we already use within the bank by using the Container Storage interface. Uh, but finally, we decided to go with OpenShift Container Storage since we are using Ceph and OpenShift Container Platform. And we are using it in an external mode. The reason why we are uh, using it this way is uh, we have uh, many OpenShift clusters. And uh, if you do not use that and use it in an internal mode with hyperconverge mode, you need to maintain and manage, uh, for example, eight different OpenShift container storage installations. And uh, with the external mode, you are only uh, using the operator uh, to, to, to communicate with the external and outside container storage. And all the person volume claims are being done with the OpenShift container storage. And we have, uh, we are also using the metadata server, uh, read write once and read write many storage classes uh, for different type of workloads. So the uh, next use case is the notification application. Uh, so uh, we have a mobile banking application, as my colleague Yenar mentioned about it. Approximately 85% of the transactions is coming through this uh, mobile banking application. And uh, whenever a customer uh, requires, uh, whenever a customer gets a new notification about uh, you have a new uh, document, kind of a document like a bank deposit or credit card, uh, credit card uh, deposit as well. So uh, they would like once they would like to access that document, they are going accessing and getting the token from the authentication server uh, which is uh, reddit sso for identity provider and once uh, they get the uh, token they are coming to self storage thanks to uh, by the way uh, secure token server second secure token service here uh, which is the same name with amazon as well and uh, self is offline by offline validation uh, self is able to validate the token and if it is valid, uh, it creates a temporary credentials to access the uh, that particular object. And uh, by the help of this integration, uh, the client and the customer is able to access its document in a safe manner, in a secure manner. Uh, the second use case that I would like to mention is the access management and auditing uh, for the Ceph object uh, storage cluster. So uh, any user which has the access key and secret key uh, for that user which consists of all the objects underneath is able to access uh, the documents so this is not a secure way of uh, accessing the documents we are planning uh, we have uh, integrated uh, such a workflow to access to gain an access to users that has needs to uh, access the objects within the object storage cluster uh, so whenever a user tries to access the document uh, they are going and trying to get the token uh, from the identity provider. Uh, so identity provider, which is Reddit SSO, the upstream key clock, uh, the upstream name is key clock, uh, is integrated with the internal Active Directory of the bank. And if they are part of that uh, Active Directory group, they are able to uh, create a new token 
for that particular need from the uh, created realm, which is uh, within the Red Hat SSO. And when, once they get the token, uh, they are uh, going and authenticating uh, with the safe storage and creating a session policy and role name with the duration uh, in order to put or get whatever action they need uh, from the uh, safe object storage. And just for that purpose, again, secure token service uh, is offline offline validating the uh, token and creating, if it's a valid token, creating an temporary credentials. And uh, by that uh, credential, the user is able to access its documents. Uh, so the other use case would, that I would like to mention is the monitoring and alerting. So Ceph is, uh, is in a really critical part of our uh, DevOps pipeline. And uh, you need to monitor really critical applications are running on top of this. And we need to monitor and uh, create alerts out of this uh, Ceph uh, storage cluster. And uh, the, we are using the embedded Prometheus engine for that. And uh, we are creating dashboards out of uh, this uh, Prometheus data, which is uh, coming from the Prometheus engine. And uh, as well as all the alerting is managed by the Prometheus alert manager. And uh, we have integrated the Prometheus Alert Manager with uh, our internal uh, ticketing system. And all the uh, error level alerts uh, creates a critical ticket to the monitoring team. Like whenever a node gets down or slow operations is just uh, introduced or any scrub errors, we are getting alerts and creating tickets out of that. And the final uh, use case that I would like to mention is the artificial intelligence use cases. Uh, so uh, my colleague Chala will, will get into details, but uh, Ceph is, is just in between within artificial intelligence pipeline. So it starts with uh, getting and collecting all the raw data within the big data uh, platform. Just after uh, we have uh, introduced the data within the big data platform, the model inputs uh, where they would be introduced to the training uh, model training, which is running on the OpenShift container platform, is stored in the uh, corresponding bucket within the safe storage. And once uh, the model is completed and the model output uh, has been done, uh, they are putting uh, the outputs uh, to the safe object storage cluster to the corresponding bucket. And once the uh, objects have been introduced, uh, we are firing a notification so that the new object uh, is there within the corresponding bucket and you can uh, keep going with the next stop in the DevOps pipeline. But uh, my colleague Chalar will get into details. So uh, I'm giving the words to Chalar. So Chalar, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Suha. Uh, I'm Chalar Gülşeni and uh, I'm working as AI architecture and development chapter lead at Ishbank. Uh, Yenal and Suha presented our uh, OpenShift and uh, safe infrastructure in uh, details. Uh, and now uh, I will talk about how we run uh, AI workloads on uh, these platforms. First, I want to uh, start with uh, briefly dis describing our uh, AI application development lifecycle. Uh, First, we start with a business analysis uh, as usual. And uh, after uh, the business analysis is uh, finished, we prepare the uh, relevant data uh, to uh, use in that uh, business case. And uh, the prepared data uh, is used in model development. Uh, it's an iterative process. Uh, the model uh, is developed, experimented, uh, changed, and uh, re-experimented. And when the model is uh, ready and the performance is uh, as expected, uh, it's deployed to the target environment. Uh, and then uh, we start monitoring our uh, model's per performance. And if there is a need, uh, we reanalyze it and uh, make changes on our model. Uh, if I uh, dive more into uh, this model uh, life cycle, uh, the first uh, step, the data preparation step, uh, has uh, two sub-steps. Uh, the first, first one is uh, preparing model data. And we perform 
uh, data preparation in our Hadoop cluster. Uh, it starts with accessing uh, related data sources uh, and aggregating the data and preparing it uh, for the model. Uh, after preparing the data, uh, we go into uh, we put the data into the uh, OpenShift uh, cluster uh, and we start processing the data and uh, developing the model. Uh, in data, uh, processing the data, uh, we uh, detect future types, input missing values, and uh, encode and scale the features. Then we uh, choose the uh, best algorithm, best performing algorithm. Uh, then we develop the model based on this algorithm and optimize the model uh, and deploy it to the target environment. Uh, this deployment uh, is uh, starts with a pilot phase or uh, there may be some A-B testing. And when uh, the model is uh, in its final state uh, is used in production. And then uh, in the final stage, we monitor the performance of the deployed model and uh, make changes to the model if needed. Uh, and if I uh, go into the architecture uh, on which we run this AI workflows, uh, there are two uh, pipelines, first the data pipeline and the model pipeline. Uh, in this slide, I will uh, tell you about which technologies, uh, which platforms we use. And in the next slide, I will go uh, into the details. Uh, in the data pipeline, we collect data from uh, Kafka and also we collect data from our data warehouse uh, and aggregate this data in our big data uh, Hadoop cluster. Uh, then we export uh, this uh, prepared data to safe object storage and our model pipeline starts. Uh, in, other, in our uh, model pipeline, uh, we run our workloads in OpenShift cluster. Uh, we also have a safe uh, FS uh, storage uh, for persistent volumes in OpenShift. And we use uh, MongoDB to uh, store our uh, data and uh, our metadata about the models. And we have a Kafka for internal messaging uh, of our applications. Uh, if I go into the uh, details uh, of our AI architecture, uh, in Event Kafka, uh, we have banking events. We collect banking events uh, from Kafka and uh, store it in our big data, cl big data cluster. Uh, and also we collect our core banking data from our data warehouse. Uh, in big data cluster, we process this, this data and uh, prepare the master uh, data uh, to be used in our uh, machine learning uh, applications. When uh, the data is uh, ready in uh, Hadoop cluster, we export it uh, to our safe object storage uh, as a model input. Uh, our trainings uh, are uh, running as batch uh, applications in our OpenShift uh, cluster. Uh, we use Argo workflows to uh, orchestrate uh, these batch uh, workflows. Uh, our predictions uh, may be uh, batch or uh, real-time uh, predictions, depending on the uh, use case. Uh, batch predictions. Uh, produce uh, model outputs uh, as a file, and we put this file also in safe object search. And if we have a uh, real-time prediction uh, in that use case, we export, uh, we expose uh, REST APIs, uh, which will be used our banking applications. Uh, as a result of training, uh, we have a, a model file, uh, and it's serialized. Uh, and uh, stored in our also in our object search. Uh, in our OpenShift cluster, we also run our Jupyter notebooks uh, used by our data science uh, team. Uh, the folders, the shared folders that our data science team use and share data with each other is stored in our safe FS storage. 
And in CFFS, we also uh, store our uh, temporal outputs. Uh, we also have some management uh, UIs in OpenShift cluster, which is used to uh, handle uh, parameters and uh, set the parameters for the models. Uh, in MongoDB, uh, we have model meta metadata, and also we keep the register of our models, uh, as well as the uh, track of the experiments. And finally, in our OpenShift cluster, we run a uh, AutoML uh, platform. Uh, it's also a part of our OpenShift uh, infrastructure. And uh, in internal messaging between pods, we, we use a, a Kafka uh, for messaging. Uh, I want to uh, summarize with uh, giving some st statistics about our uh, AI uh, landscape. Uh, our AI team has uh, se about 70 people, uh, which is divided into eight uh, teams. And currently, we have more than 30 applications running in production. Uh, to run these applications, uh, we have 30 servers uh, with more than 50 GPUs. And uh, we have a uh, CPU farm of uh, more than uh, 3,000 V cores. And we have more than 50 terabytes of memory. And as a search, we use uh, 50 terabytes of safe search at the moment and uh, more than 30 terabytes of object search. And we have uh, batch applications, API, and uh, UI. And we have Jupyter notebooks, uh, which we have, uh, which which are more than thirty uh, pods running concurrently, and uh, ten AutoML pods are also running on uh, GPU in OpenShift cluster. And uh, I want to finish my uh, verse uh, with uh, giving some example uh, applications that uh, we uh, develop in our uh, AI team. Uh, we have. Uh, pricing applications, uh, including retail, long-term deposit, and uh, fixed pricing. Uh, we have a next product to buy application. Uh, we have loan underwriting uh, applications, and uh, we have churn uh, models. Also, we are developing some NLP uh, models that are used for uh, internal uh, purposes. And we have an ATM cache and root optimization uh, models. Uh, we also have an AOPS applications, which is uh, used uh, in our uh, IT infrastructure for uh, capturing uh, IT uh, anomalies in our uh, IT systems before uh, they cause a problem. Thank you uh, for listening to us, uh, and if you have any questions, we will be happy to answer it. All right. Diane, no one can hear you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there's it, it, it's um, muted and remuted and on that, that. But um, you know, Kareem and everybody. Yes, thanks. Um, I muted myself there. But I, I really love the Isobank story um, a lot because I it, mean it's a huge Ceph deployment, but also mm -hmm. that how they threaded in um, their AI story and their AI workloads and how they're making it all, uh, you know, taking some of their legacy stuff over and, and just making it work. Um, it's, it's a testament to um, their persistence and um, to uh, the, the ability of uh, OpenShift to, to take on a variety of tasks from CI, CD to the workloads that they're looking at. This next talk, um, which I also loved. I, I love a lot of talks, so um, I'm very biased towards end user talks, especially um, those that uh, 
advocate for change, like the sustainability one from Erickson. But this next one is from the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. And um, with all the stuff that's going on in the world these days, it's, it's wonderful to see the collaboration that happened between some Red Hatters in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, Clayton Cla Clarence Clayton and Christopher Tate are part of this pr presentation, along with Tyler Wittenberg, who's the chief counsel for the for justice reform for the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Um, um, they're a nonprofit based in Durham, North Carolina, um, and Red Hat's been working with them to see how they could make um, and help uh, facilitate making a greater impact on some work they do around racial equity report cards. And they leveraged a little bit of Red Hat Ansible Foundation and OpenShift um, and really saved a lot of time and energy um, for, so that they could focus not on the technical aspects, but on getting stuff done and making a difference and making a change. So without any further ado, this is going to be our last talk of the day because we're running up right against the noon hour. Um, and then everything else we had listed for today is available in the Red Hat Session Summit session catalog and will be. And then we'll come back again probably in another month or so and do a less clunky version of um, end user stories and do this again. Um, so here, without any further ado, um, is Tyler Wittenberg um, and the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. And I think it's a great way to end the day. Wonderful. Queuing it up now. Hello everyone, and welcome to this session entitled Using Open Source and Open Data to Address Educational Disparities. We look forward to sharing more about this wonderful work and partnership during our time together today. My name is Clarence Clayton. I manage the data privacy team at Red Hat and have been with the company since 2013. I'm also honored to serve as the chair of the BUILD community, which stands for Blacks United in Leadership and Diversity. And it's in that capacity that I'm with you today. BUILD is one of Red Hat's diversity and inclusion communities. Now, other companies may refer to them as affinity groups or ERGs. I'd like to briefly introduce our community and talk about the role we played in bringing this partnership together. BUILD exists to foster a connected community of Black Red Hatters and allies. We formed in 2015 and officially launched as a community in 2017 so we'll be celebrating our fourth anniversary later this summer. We do a lot of work to enhance and improve the Black associate experience, and we do this through member development, social opportunities, and service to the community. Now, with that in mind, the story of today's session really began in May of 2020. The death of George Floyd and the resulting protests and demonstrations hit very close to home for me personally, as well as Red Hat as a company. There were protests in downtown Raleigh, right outside Red Hat's headquarters, and everything that was happening compelled our company to take action. You'll see here a statement from our CEO, Paul Cormier, letting it be known that Red Hat stood in solidarity with the black community in the fight for social justice. Now, this was an important step, but really only the beginning of the work. Red Hat wanted to make it clear that words were not enough and that we could do more. So Paul and the corporate leadership team asked us to identify organizations that we could partner with and contribute to. Following the open decision framework principles, the Bill community voted and selected the Southern Coalition for Social Justice as one of those organizations. Now you'll see here that, that the three partnerships represented there the BUILD community, the Red Hat Social Innovation Program, and the Southern Coalition. I'll now explain how these three groups came together. So after the Southern Coalition was selected and a monetary donation was made, some of my BUILD leadership colleagues and I started building a relationship with Tyler Wittenberg and Ryan Roberson, who are on the staff of the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. We wanted to find ways to provide more than just monetary support, though. Around that same time, Alexandra Machado, who leads the Red Hat Social Innovation Program, reached out to me about possible partnership opportunities between her program and the BUILD community. 
The Social Innovation Program connects the talent, skills, and expertise of Red Hatters to causes that matter to them and allow them to make a difference in the world outside of Red Hat. So I thought it was a perfect opportunity to connect her with Tyler and Ryan. So we met and quickly identified some technical challenges and inefficiencies that the Southern Coalition was facing, and we thought that Red Hat could help address them. So Alexandra then brought in Kevin Ritter and Christopher Tate, who you'll meet in a few moments, to get that work underway. We're really excited for you to see what we did. So without further delay, I will turn it over to Tyler Wittenberg, who will introduce himself and the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Thank you for that introduction, Clarence. Uh, yes, my name is Tyler Wittenberg. Uh, I work with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, which partners with communities of color and economically disadvantaged communities throughout the South to defend and advance their political, social, and economic rights. We do this primarily through what we call community or movement lawyering, where we provide uh, legal and policy analysis, communication support, strategic research, as well as support and organizing efforts. And one big issue that we work on is the school to prison pipeline. So what is the school to prison pipeline? The school to prison pipeline is really a web that consists of policies, practices, uh, and a systemic uh, investment in schools and in certain practices that we know actually support students of color in particular. Uh, part of that has to do with um, uh, lack of investment in things that we know support students academically. So we look at academic achievement. We also look at the use of exclusionary discipline, that being suspensions and expulsions, uh, because we know that students who are suspended or, or expelled are more likely to enter the justice system. And then we also look at that direct funneling of youth into the justice system, which is school-based referrals to law enforcement. We identify uh, disparities within all these areas, and we do so by county using the racial equity report cards. So these import cards are important because they really give a temperature check on what the school to prison pipeline looks like in any particular school district in North Carolina, 115 of them. So it's a lot of work to put these together. Uh, these are used by advocates, teachers, students, uh, elected officials, whether, whether it's school board members or legislators, uh, all to I, to track progress, to see where there's also maybe some regression, and to plot a course for how we end the school to prison pipeline moving forward. And it is a very laborious process, right? So uh, a lot of data that is inputted one at a time, which is why it used to take us three months, uh, a few attorneys, three months, and uh, a lot of interns to get this done. And we were also kind of static in the process because we're not able to really maneuver if there's any revisions that need to uh, need to be done. Um, so with that, I'll pass it to Christopher Tate uh, so he can explain exactly what technology you all provided that was able to really uh, help us build capacity for ourselves and for the communities that we work with. Let's talk about the solution. The new site allows the team to input data into an online form for a given school district and a given school year and make the up-to-date report cards available instantly. The whole project is completely deployed on OpenShift, a PostgreSQL database to store the data input into the form, an Apache Solar Search Engine for storing data for analytics and reporting, a Red Hat single sign-on server for user management and role-based access control, and an Apache Zookeeper cluster manager for scaling the whole application. The Red Hat Ansible automation platform deployed the image streams, secrets, deployment configs, build configs, services, and routes for all the open source applications to staging and production for flexible innovation The new Racial Equity Report Card site is available at rerc.southerncoalition.org. Now I will share my screen and we'll walk through the site together. Let's go to the production deployment of the Racial Equity Report Card site. Here you can see 
the Apache Solar Search Engine deployed, and the Apache Zookeeper Cluster Manager, and the Postgres database, and the Red Hat Single Sign-On Server, and the RERC Southern Coalition application. So I click on this, and you see the pod running, and there's a route to it. So I'm going to click on this route to go straight to the site. Here is the home page for the site. You can scroll down and read all about racial equity report cards and why they're important. I'm going to scroll back up to the top and log in like the Southern Coalition team would do. Enter my username and password. Now here I get access to everything. Let's go to the state of North Carolina because that's where we have data available. So this is the state of North Carolina and you'll see that it's related to many different school districts or agencies here. Let's go to Alexander County, for example. And so this is the record for Alexander County. And you'll see that there are two report cards available for Alexander County 2018 school year and 2019 school year. Let's go to the 2018 school year. This is the form for entering data. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. These are the inputs that are tracked. You can put this side by side and you can access the data where this comes from. The team will go and pull up this data side by side and look at it and record these values over here, and along the way, they can see up-to-date calculations going on to verify that what they're putting in is correct. So this is pupils and membership by race and sex, for example. Down below, there is personnel summary, which is the number of school teachers within the district. And here is some school-based complaint data from this site here. And there's suspension data, long-term and short-term suspensions from this site here. And there's academic achievement data. So how they're doing on standardized tests and college readiness from this site here. So after entering all of this data, you can go back up to the top and view the report card for this county. Here is Alexander County in 2018. You can see the school district demographics of the percentage of white students versus Pacific Islander versus multiracial or Latinx or black or Asian or indigenous and the total population. You can see some summary statistics about college readiness and short term suspensions and juvenile complaints. You can see the ratio of students to teachers of various races and the academic achievement, whether students are graduating within four years of entering high school, the short-term suspensions and long-term suspensions and expulsions, and the short-term suspensions by race, and the juvenile complaints. So lots of good information here. Now, another way to make sense of this data 
is through the powerful open API behind the site. So I want to introduce you to that. I'm going to pull up a new tab to API slash report card. And so I'll show you what one of these records looks like. This is a lot of data to look at. We're going to filter it down a little bit so that it makes more sense. First of all, I'm going to only show certain fields. I create a field list of agency name, pupils total, report card start year, short term suspensions, black versus white and graduate within four years, black percent. Now what we have here is a much smaller set of data for what we want to see. Let's do some additional work here. We're going to filter this with a filter query of report card start year of 2018. And another filter query on pupils total greater than 10,000. So this will filter on counties that have more than 10,000 students. And we're going to sort this data, graduate within four years, black percent, ascending. That will show the report cards where black students are less likely to graduate from high school within four years first. Here we have a report card in Henderson County where the percentage of black students graduating within four years is 77%. So let's take a look at that report card. I'm going to go back here and look at change this to Henderson County. And we'll scroll down to the graph. So you can see here how 77.5% is pretty low for that statistic. Now let's go back to the API and just switch this real quick to instead of ascending to descending, and we get counties where the percentage of black students graduating within four years is very high. Let's take a look at Lincoln County. So we go back here, change Henderson County to Lincoln. County. Scroll down to the graph. And you'll see that the percentages in all the groups is very even. We can figure out solutions where one county is doing really well. What can we do in other counties that can make a difference? Tyler, how has the new site helped your team achieve its goals for racial equity report cards? Well, as I mentioned, it went from being a three month project to a three day project. Now it takes about three of us, no interns, three days, uh, which means we're able to have more partnerships uh, with community members. It means that the racial equity report cards themselves no longer become this la larger burden 
uh, that ends up being its own project. Now it really is a tool to advance the work um, as we work with our community in, in various ways. Um, also, sometimes we misspell stuff. Sometimes we get uh, one data point wrong. Um, sometimes the data is updated and changed, and we have to be able to react to that because we're posting this information as, you know, it is publicly available data, but we're posting our analysis and we want everyone to know that we are responsive to it, we are accountable to it. So now when there's a very, there's a change of any kind, really, we're able to either go in there ourselves and change it in real time right then and there, or simply reach out to Chris and get, uh, get uh, either advice on how to do the change or uh, support in changing it right away. It makes us far more responsive than we were prior to this um, relationship with Red Hat. And the timing couldn't be, um, could not have been better. Um, it is good to hear about the story of uh, how Red Hat came to this work uh, and then responding to the uprising around the murder of George Floyd. We were also at a time where we needed to be extremely um, available to our community while we also had the obligation to use race safety report cards. So we were able to be just as responsible as responsive as we needed to be, while also do what we said we we're going to do and get these reports out and do so actually in a much more timely manner than we did last time. So I speak for all of the Southern uh, Coalition for Social Justice in saying we are immensely appreciative for the support from Red Hat. We look forward to this uh, collaboration continuing, um, and from from we look forward to learning about ways that coding itself can advance the fight for social justice and and just really appreciative to be uh, in collaboration with you all. Strengthening our children, our families and our communities is the most important work we can do. This work with SESJ shows that open collaboration to create a shared solution, leveraging each other's expertise can solve a common problem Red Hat will continue to support SESJ through technology so that they can continue to make a difference in the world. Thank you. And we're back. All right. Well, thank you, Chris, for producing today and working through all of the kinks. And um, one of the things is we're, especially this last talk, I was really appreciative of um, of the work that Tyler and Chris and Clarence had done to make this happen. And um, these are the kinds of stories that really make us um, uh, thrilled to be part of these co collaborations. And we're immensely um, happy to be part of it as well as um, for the, all the work that the folks at the Center for uh, Social Justice uh, are doing. And we look forward to doing more collaboration with you. If any of you out there are watching this now and you have a story that you wanna tell, an end user story, a workload story, some new technology initiative you're, you're taking on, I heartily encourage you to, to come to commons.openship.org. If you're not already a member, join um, or reach out to myself or Chris or um, the OpenShift Commons Twitter handle and um, we'd be happy to give you the podium and let you tell your story and share it with your peers because we all learn from each other and that's really the point of OpenShift Commons and today is by sharing these stories you get to see the, the, the immense variety of the work that people are doing that is leveraging Red Hat technologies and not just OpenShift but Ceph and all kinds of other Ansible pieces and parts of, the, of our different product suites. So we really love that everybody has stepped up today and shared their stories with us and allowed us to share them with you and look forward to doing it again sometime soon. So thanks again to Chris and to Bobby Kessler and the other folks at OpenShift TV for producing this session. So take You're care. Quite welcome. Thank we'll you. We'll see Diane. you next time, Chris. Yeah, take it easy out there. Stay safe.